Welcome again to the Comic Book Historian Podcast. I'm Alex Grand with my co-host Jim Thompson. Today we are speaking to Mark Chiarello, who is a painter, art director, and editor in the comics business. As a painter, he has worked on such projects as Batman Story, Batman Houdini, The Devil's Workshop, and Clive Barker's Hellraiser. As an editor for DC Comics, he co-created Batman Black and White miniseries, for which he received Eisner Awards in 1997, and again in 2003, and fan-favorite series like Solo and Wednesday Comics. Mark, thanks for joining us today. Oh, cool. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So we're going to have Jim start off with kind of the early parts of your life. So Jim, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, Mark, that's what I usually like to do is to start from like birth forward and just get a sense of your relationship with comics as a kid. So I know you were born on Halloween 1960 in New Jersey. Where in New Jersey? Central New Jersey, right in the middle in, in Freehold, uh, where Bruce Springsteen is from. Ah, okay. And tell me about your upbringing, like your parents, you know, what, what you, your basic upbringing. Sure. I mean, it's probably going to be boring, but so we'll get the comics really fast. But, you know, I grew up in suburbia, New Jersey, in the 60s and mid, late 60s and 70s. And, you know, like every other kid, I was, you know, my parents were, my dad worked for Ford Motor Company and my mom was a housewife, a homemaker. And, you know, it was just like a normal you know, growing up as a kid, watched television nonstop, you know, repeats of the Twilight Zone and the Brady Bunch and Mary Tyler Moore, you know, just a regular kid, really. And I always, you know, I drew in my room all the time. You know, I was kind of a quiet kid and kept to myself a lot. And I spent most of my time just sitting around drawing all day. Were you an early reader? Uh, yeah, I, I really was, you know, and it's still something that I do nonstop here. I just love to read. Always have. I hope I always will. I hope my eyesight doesn't go. But yeah, I love to read. And, that, and was you know, that it does. noticeable that you were like a better artist than the other kids at some point? And if so, what point was that? Well, it wasn't. It wasn't. I mean, I, you know, I'm a kind of a shy guy, so I never really showed my drawings to anybody. You know, I'd never speak up at school and say, hey, look what I drew. I'm just not built that way. But I was kind of singled out as the best or one of the two best artists in this whole school. And then you get to, you know, and then I went to college. I went to Pratt Institute and all of a sudden everybody else is better than you. And it's like, you know. Oh yeah. No, I can't, I can't wait to talk about Pratt because that's interesting in terms of going, I think to even your roommates. But first, when did you start, when did you start actually reading comics? Well, when I was a kid, obviously in the, in the late sixties, the Batman Adam West TV show was so immense <laughs> that, you know, you just fell in love with that stuff. You fell in love with that show and that character and that world. But I didn't realize that, oh, wait a minute, you could also buy comic books with these characters. You know, and it wasn't until years later, a good friend of mine, a, you know, one of my best friends as a kid, a guy named Mike Hugh Miller, he started collecting Spider-Man comics. And this must be, you know, like 1970 or something. And, uh, I was like, oh my God, these are great. And, you know, and yeah, they were. And I just fell in, I fell in love with that world, you know, like Spider-Man shit John Romita was drawn in. Right. You know, Stan had stopped and I think Jerry Conway started and then Ross Andrew started drawing them. And were you mainly a, a Marvel reader or did you do both? Purely Marvel. I mean, I was before the first movie you know, that's who I was and, you know, even a, a good friend of mine from high school, a guy named Frank, he was the big DC guy and I'm like, oh, that's such crap. How could you read that stuff? It's so antiquated. Oh my God, it's terrible. Marvel is what you should read because, I mean, think about it. You know, those early 70s, mid 70s, Barry, Barry Smith, Barry Windsor Smith was doing Conan and mm -hmm. Howard the Duck was real fun and you were coming off all those great years of... Oh, uh, yeah. No, I, I'm the same uh, age as you, and that Steve Gerber, Don McGregor, the master of Kung Fu with Glossy. There was, it was like just a such riches that it's, it's amazing what, what was being produced during that early 70s period right, all over the place. Yeah. The writer-editor the writer -editor age of, of Marvel. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And it um, showed, man, it was cool. And so... So at some point, when you were going to decide to go to art school, did you have in mind, hey, maybe I'll end up in comics? No, not at all. You know, I was this, again, quiet kid who sat home and drew all day. And, you know, college rolled around. You graduated from high school. College rolled around. And I enrolled at a, at a you know, mainstream college in New Jersey, Fairleigh Dickinson University. And I went for literally two weeks. And I was just miserable. I'm like, I want to be an artist. I don't want to do this shit. I don't want to be a, a doctor, a lawyer, an accountant. You know? <laughs> and I actually, I actually quit the school and, you know, I enrolled at Pratt 
it's a short, a short layover. And it was like, man, you know, it was like I came home. I hate to use that phrase, but holy shit, I was around all these great artists who were into exactly what I was into, you know? Right. It was, but to answer your question, no, I didn't expect to be a comic book artist. My whole thing was when I was a kid, I would love, there was that publication TV guide, you know, and you'd get it every week. I'm not even <laughs> sure that they even produce it anymore, but you'd get it every week and it would tell you, you know, what was going to be on that weekend. Oh my God, they're going to show Jaws this week or whatever it was, you know, all the TV shows. But these great famous American illustrators would illustrate the cover of that. Right. Um, Including you know, Jack I'm Davis. Happy. Jack Davis, one of the great, great, greats, you know, Bob Peake and, you know, all these incredible Bernie Fuchs. I love Fuchs. So, you know, so I, as a kid, I would see Time Magazine with these artists on the cover, Newsweek, uh, you know, Sports Illustrated use illustrators. On, and that was, I was a bit odd in that I knew exactly what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to do that stuff. I wanted my mom to be able to walk into the drugstore, the, the supermarket and say, oh, yeah, my son did that painting of Magnum PI, you know, on the cover of TV Guide. And yeah, I, I used to, to I used to clip them and put them in scrapbooks. I was a oh, TV no. Guide nut about no, the exact same thing. Do you still have them? No, I do not. Uh, no. Probably hey, your mom probably threw them away, huh? No, she was pretty good. I mean, I still have every comic I ever bought. She was not one of those moms. I don't know what happened to the scrapbooks, but yeah, I used to take out everything from TV Guide, especially oh, okay. the drawings. Are you and an especially? Or you just were a fan? I was always, I drew all the time too. I ended up not being an artist. I thought about going to art school, but I went to law school. Oh, okay. But yeah, I can draw a little bit. Um, oh, cool. So you went to, to, and then were your parents supportive when you switched over to art school? You know, my parents have always been lovely. They've always been supportive of, of whatever I wanted to do, but they kind of looked at me sideways like, well, you're going to starve. You're going to be an artist, you know what I mean? Because... You know, growing up in the New York area, you know, Italian parents, mm -hmm. artists were, you know, never, there was that cliche view of the starving artist with the beard and not making any rent. Right. Uh, but then I, you know, right after college, I got a gig, I got a job at Disney and with Disney down in Florida. And they kind of, you know, it was the first time that they kind of thought, well, maybe he is going to make a living because again, you know, the American public knew Walt Disney as, the successful artist, you know? Yeah. yeah. As soon as you had that Disney stamp of approval, everybody relaxed. I'm, I'm sure. Let's go to Pratt for a few minutes in terms of, I had read that you had, and I, I'm not clear if they were, you were all together, but you were roommates with Kent Williams, John Van Fleet and George Pratt. Is that true? Yeah. George lived upstairs, but he was always in, he was on the floor above us, but he was always in our room. And we were always in his room. Yeah, but Van Fleet and I were best friends. And Kent, you know, the four of us were just, oh, my God, we were inseparable. It was a really incredible year of artists, just some incredible, incredible people who we're all still in touch with. What year was this, Mark? Oh, man, don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> was it 1980 or? Well, Pratt was in in 1980, so it, it, at least that was part of it for sure, because I looked up that. He was yeah, 1980. I want to say like 81, 82, right in there, 83, okay. right in there. Okay, early 80s, all right. But, man, so, you know, like I said, and I apologize because I know I'm talking really fast, but I just had a really big cup of coffee, so, no, that's so I good. apologize. But, you know, what I was saying about when I got to college, I was among my people, Kent and John and George and a few other guys, we would sit around and we were exactly like each other. We'd talk about, you know, oh, the new Raiders of the Lost Ark movie came out and let's go see Blade Runner. And, you know, we'd go to the magazine shops and look for Brad Holland illustrations. And it was the greatest time. It was really just we were all fraternal. It was just that fraternal sounds great. Thing. And isn't that amazing that you all had, you know, you all ended up working in comics at some level or not? Yeah. Yeah, because we were, we were all comics fans as kids. Now, were you reading, by that point, were you, were any of you reading comics still? Yeah. I mean, that was an interesting time because you had the, what's the, there's a phrase for that time of comics, you know, Rocketeer and Love and Rockets. What's that? What, what are they called? It's the, not the independent market, but, you know, those kind of not, not main, not Marvel and DC stuff. Yeah. But, right. well, I mean, they weren't, it, it wasn't the alternative stuff that's out 
I mean, that's so, that is so indie, but it was the age of the Hernandez brothers had come on the scene. Dave Sim was doing Cerebus. Chaikin yeah. was doing uh, American Flag. I mean, all of that stuff was out there and was really pretty ground, incredibly groundbreaking and yet yeah, accessible. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, but, but you also had, yes, yeah, that's true. We love that stuff. Man, when Rocketeer first came out, those first couple of issues that he did, that Dave uh, did, yeah. it was just beautiful stuff. But you also right. had, yeah, Frank Miller drawing Daredevil at Marvel, and that was right. foolish shit too, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then he goes switches over and does Ronan, and it's like look at the production value of that. And you guys must have all been like so aware of that it's no longer on comic paper and looking, you know, like there was so much experimentation in terms of design at that point, which I assume you had an interest in that early on because it's such a feature of your own work. Yeah, yeah, that just turned us on, you know, because we, I think, well, I know Kent was, Kent was, Kent was drawing, when I first met Kent, he was drawing, or when I first moved in with him, he was drawing a short story for, I'm pretty sure it was Epic Illustrated, which Archie ran, which is a good one, and I was just like, oh my God, and look, I'm going to say something, please don't laugh at me, but you're going to think I'm ridiculous, but I never realized people wrote and draw comics, drew comics. I, you know, of course, logically they did and they do, but I, I didn't realize that you could get a job doing that, that these were real people, you know? Right. Uh, you know, and, and I, when I had a roommate who was actually drawing this stuff, it really opened my eyes. And Kent said to me, you know, geez, Mark, you're the biggest comics fan out of all of us. I know this guy at Marvel named Archie Goodwin. You're really very similar people. Uh, the sweetest guy. You should go get a job with him. So that's uh-huh. Kind of my first foray into the professional. And that's how you met Archie. World. Okay. Oh, that's yeah. great. That's really yeah. interesting. And they so, and they were doing things that looked like what you might see at school. Because I'm I'm thinking of like Moonshadow and what Moose was doing. And and you you guys are looking at stuff like that, right? Yeah. Well, you know, as roommates, Kent was Kent did a fill an issue of Moonshadow, and George was George came downstairs, and they were both painting it together in Kent's room. Well, it was astounding. I was like, you know, and I got to know Jay and I really love his work and um, it it just, I guess that's my point. It showed me that, well, people do this. You can do this, you know? Right. It's capable. Oh. It's not just a mythical thing. It's a real thing. Exactly. He mystified it for me. Right. All right so it. I'm, so I'm well, going to take you out of Pratt now and get you in the real world and Alex is going to take you from there. Okay, so cool. what, so what, what what did you do at Disney World when you started there in Florida? Well, I, I started as an intern on um, this program. They would take a few people every year, and uh, and I moved down there. And I think they took like two graphic designers, two animators, and one illustrator. And I was the one illustrator. I was picked out of all the art schools in the country. And you know, and I moved down there. Oh my God, Disney! This is going to be cool. And it really was cool, but. I didn't like living in Florida. I was just not, you know, I'm such a, I'm such a tri-state area guy. I'm such a New Yorker that it was like, uh-huh. oh, I hate Florida. Jeepers. Like uh, you felt it was kind of boring, maybe? Well, it was always hot, <laughs> you know? Okay. And, uh, you know, and uh, one of my, one of my nerd things is the Disney parks, Disneyland, Disney World. So that was fun because I'd go every day after uh-huh. work or for lunch or whatever. Oh, that other cool. than that, I just I missed home, so I didn't I didn't stay there very long at all, and I moved back up. So what, you were just there for maybe a year or something? Oh, much less, much less, but just a bunch of months. Oh, okay, just a month. And were you doing animation there? You were just you were doing animation basically. No, no, I wasn't in the animation department. I was in the illustration department. And illustration, like okay. Brochures, yeah, brochures for the park or posters for the park. Oh, okay. Uh huh. Yeah. I see, which is certainly a skill that we've seen of yours. Okay, I see what you're saying. So then after Disney, you went up to New York. And is that when you started working on the 1986 Adventures of Galaxy Rangers TV show? Yeah, yeah, it really is. Man, I forgot about that. Yeah, I got I got a job right away. There's not, most of the animation done out here in California, but there was a show that was being produced in New York called the Adventures of the Galaxy Rangers. It was on... I guess it was on Channel 11 PIX in New York, but um, it was 65 mm-hmm. episodes, and I was sort of the art director. Oh, know, okay. Cross- but I would also organize everybody else. Mm-hmm. And did you did, would you draw stills as well, or animate things, or was it more like you were overseeing the project? I started, I was hired as a storyboard artist, so we would get the script, and you know it was a half-hour animated show, and we would have to storyboard every scene, 
uh-huh. you know, and I was doing that and it was fun. But then my boss said, well, you're kind of like the adult of all these 20 storyboard artists. Uh-huh. Why don't you, why don't you organize the whole thing? the art of all this stuff and get it all together and ship it off to, I think it was animated in Japan. So I would FedEx it to Japan and make sure all the characters were coded and all that stuff. So my seeming maturity kind of elevated me to art director sort of. Yeah, that's great. So is that when you kind of realize you can be both an artist and manage other artists? Is that your first taste of that? Yeah, I guess it is. I think it is. You know, over the years, I've always had a hard time you know, because I embraced being the art director so much at DC. I always had a hard time coming home on the weekend and doing any artwork because I was exhausted from the job. Right. But yeah, yeah, I'm really torn. In my, I've always been torn in my head. Should I be an artist or should I organize artists, be an art director? I'm never quite sure. Right. It's kind of a hybrid conflict. So then why did you leave that TV show and how did you get into doing Lost Planet 2 for Eclipse in 87? Is there... Was that your first published comic? You know, tell us about that transition and doing that that comic. And that was after college, so we all sort of moved down the street to you know, Pratt is in Brooklyn, so we all sort of moved, you know, the next neighborhood over to um to Park Slope. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, Fleet and I shared an apartment and George Pratt lived around the corner and George George was the nicest guy on the planet. We'd always have other artists hanging out, staying over. One of the guys he became friends with was Scott Hampton, who was from North Carolina, North Carolina, South Carolina, North Carolina. And Scotty is a cool guy. Scotty is such a brilliant, brilliant artist. And, you know, we really hit it off. And he said, hey, my brother Bo is putting together a comic book called Lost Planet for Eclipse. Would you want to? He knew what we were talking about. We were talking about history, American history all the time. I'm a real big history nut. And he said, hey, there's a story about Amelia Earhart. Would you want to draw it? And I was like, man, cool. Absolutely. You know, it's like a 10 page story, eight page story, whatever. And he sent me the script, and I was really excited about it. And there was that moment where I got the script, and I was like, holy shit, I have to actually draw this thing now. (laughs) And that's frightening, because, you know, I'm one of those guys that's, I'm one of those artists that feel that everyone judges me as a human being based on my art. If they don't Uh, like my art, then they're not going to like me. Yeah, that's funny. Like, you take it personally. Yeah, yeah, and to this day, I really wish I wasn't like that, but I am. But yeah, so I did that. I did that story. It came out okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then what made you go to Marvel? Like your friend who knew Archie Goodwin, was it the introduction that then you got into Marvel? How did that work? Yeah, I was still very close with Kent and, 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 you know, and all the guys, George and and Van Fleet and Kent said, hey, I'm I'm still working for Marvel. I'm doing jobs for him here and there. Go see Archie. I think he's looking for an assistant, a secretary or an assistant. So I met a guy named Carl Pott. He said, oh, you know, I have an opening. You want to interview? And I actually didn't get the job. And that you did not get the job. And I went around the, what's that? You said you did not get the job. I did not get the job with Carl, but I went around the corner of the day. I went around, you know, literally down the hall and met with Archie. And I said, yeah, oh, I'd love to hire you. You know, if you're a friend of Ken's, then, then absolutely. You know, and we chatted for 10 minutes and, and I got that job. Oh, wow. So I'm Archie. I was, yeah, I was just Archie's assistant for you know, maybe a year and a half. Ah, that's awesome. So then that's around the time when you were, uh, you had, you had some involvement in what the Marvel Epic imprint graphic novel in 88, someplace strange by Nocenti and Bolton. Is that correct? Yeah, that was one of the, that was one of the books. Archie ran Epic illustrated and it had just ended at that time when I came on. And that time is, I think shooter had just left Marvel. So that's around the time frame, Right. Um, and DeFalco took over. Archie, you know, Archie ran Epic, which was the magazine, but then it, it segued into an imprint, a series of comics. And that was a great time for me to kind of step into this because we started doing, reprinting the Mobius stuff from France. You know, uh, really right. nice graphic novels, you know, and we did Akira. Yeah. The first time it had, it had been translated into English. But yeah, the John Bolton book was one of them. And it was just, you know, it was just such a great, a great learning ground. So you were editing some of these books, right? No, I was just Archie's secretary. I was Archie's assistant. I'd answer his phone and I would type up scripts if he asked me to. I was just kind of like, you know, the all-purpose power tool. I just did whatever Archie needed. I gotcha. Okay, okay. So kind of, so he was editing, but, and then you'd kind of, you'd assist him in in these processes of of putting these books out. Totally, yeah. And that's where I learned my jobs, really. And, you know, I have said it before and I will say it till the day I die, the 
the fact that I was working with this guy, Archie Goodwin, was just the most incredible learning experience to this very day. I mean, I have a great dad, but Archie became like my second dad. You know? Oh, that's awesome. Oh, man. I, you, I'm sure you, both of you, have mentioned Archie to people or they've mentioned yes. Archie to you. And Absolutely. Always so we, get, we get this in almost every interview. I mean, that yeah. he is the person no one speaks bad of. It's, it's so true. It's absolutely so true. He was just the funniest, uh, I won't use the F word, but he was just the funniest guy you've ever met. He was sort of like, I always equate him to the comedian, uh, Bob Newhart. He was Bob Newhart. <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome. That's a great analogy. For I love right. Bob Newhart. Uh-huh. That's Man, cool. uh-huh. he would have loved Archie. And, you know, and he was a brilliant writer. To this day, I think he's, I think he's probably still my favorite writer ever in comics. It just, his stuff was so adult and it was so incredible and certainly certainly the best editor ever ever to work in comics so the guy yeah. was, the guy was the so, triple threat and, and, and he uh, knew his, his, he knew how to do like cater those stories just right for the artist i mean what he did at warren with how he gave steve ditko the opportunity to do that run of stories that ditko did and mm-hmm. toth and, and all the others it's like he understood how to write it for those specific artists he's a real talent at that you're absolutely right. He was the king of that stuff. Do you feel like he was an influence on you and able to, in being malleable to work with various artists on different projects? Yeah, I don't mean to be corny about it, but he taught me the basics of what I did all those years at DC. You know, uh-huh. I remember, I remember him saying, Mark, here's what you do. You hire the very best talent, the very best guy you can. And I apologize, I use the, I use the term guy to mean men and women, guys and gals. Right, sure, the best uh, artist. The very best. Yeah, and hire the very best talent you could possibly find, and then kind of get out of their way. Just facilitate them. Make sure the accounting department's not up their ass, or make sure whatever. Let them draw. Let them do what you hired them for. Don't try to tell Bill Sienkiewicz what colors to use. Don't you know? You know what I mean? It, yeah. it, that stuck with me. And all those years at DC, I was there for twenty six years. All those years, you know, it really the best thing about all those years was that relationship with those artists being able to talk to Adam Hughes and Tim Sale and not tell them what to do, but just kind of like get them jazzed to do what they do. Right. Yeah. And I think Tim Sale and Howard Chicken told us that about you, that you were very creator friendly and you let them create. And I think that's a mutual respect you guys have for each other. It sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. Just, you know, we're all into the same stuff. So just have fun with it really. Right. So now around that time you did, did you do the coloring for the shadow, the Marvel graphic novel shadow where Kaluta returned to the character? Did you color that book? Man, I forgot about that. Yes, I did. They, you know, that old process blue line coloring, you know, that uh-huh. stuff. they printed out the pages on blue line, which is this weird, they print them, they print the artwork as this light blue line work. And then there's an overlay, like an acetate piece of, a piece of acetate with the line work on really arcane, bizarre process and they mike was really late mike was supposed to Kaluta was supposed to ink that book and it was gorgeous but then he was really kind of running very late with it so they got russ heath i believe to ink it mm-hmm. but all the time had been eaten up by those guys so they gave the colors was supposed to be a guy named john wellington he was supposed to color it but he had literally three days to color the entire graphic novel mm-hmm. so john asked me he said hey come sleep over my place for three days we got to work nonstop on this thing. So it was, it was me, Wellington, a guy named Nick Janeshig, and Steve Pusilato, who's still very um, active in comics. Mm-hmm. And the four of us sat there for two or three days and just cranked on it. And I think we did a we did an okay job considering what we were, you know, that there was a gun to our heads on it. Huh. That's a great book. So yeah, I, I would say so. Yeah. So then tell us about Hellraiser. How did you get into the Clive Barker Hellraiser book? And you did a story with Kent Williams, right? No, I don't think I've ever actually worked with Kent. The Hellraiser story I did was... Shit, shit, my memory's gone. <laughs> Man, I, I think Jan Stranod wrote it, maybe. Ooh, oh, okay. Right. Okay, oh, okay. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, and I painted it, I illustrated it, and that was, that. you know, that was... I'm trying, I can't, you know, I honestly can't remember how that came about. I, I, I probably was just, I used to hang out in the offices a lot because it was fun. You were young, you were in your 20s, and you right. played baseball in Central Park. You had done a cover for uh, the issue before it or so, and then you did the one story. 
Okay. Or at least that's I've, that's I've, that's I've what you indicate. <laughs> <laughs> But it's like, you know, I mean, I, I'm sure you've been up to the Marvel and DC offices. It's like, you know, it's all editorial and legal and all that stuff. But once in a while, you see, oh, hey, there's there's Frank Miller walking down the hall and there's Bill Sienkiewicz. You know, I mean, it is like that. And it's awesome. So when an editor sees Bill Sienkiewicz walking down the hall, he'll say, hey, Bill, come here. You want to draw this thing for me? And I think that's how the. I think that's how that Clive Barker story came about. Right, right. It's like, uh, hey, Mark, uh, you know, help us out. You want to do this? Yeah. And then you yeah. did some um, covers for the Epic line books, and you were coloring some Marvel books and some covers, and you worked on some characters like Wolverine, the Punisher, and Moon Knight. Is that that's correct, right? Yeah, I sort of started because I don't. Have, I never until recently. I never had real faith in my talent, so it's like, oh my god, I have to, you know, again, I have to draw this thing, or so I sort of like. I won't say chickened out, but I I realized that while well, I'm a really good colorist, I might as well just be a colorist in comics. That's a you can make a lot of money doing that, and it's it's a little like coloring in a coloring book when you're a kid. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of fun, a lot of fun, and a lot less stress uh, unless there's mm -hmm. a killer deadline. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I colored a lot of stuff. I colored um, I colored Wolver some Wolverine stuff that Buscema drew, John Buscema drew, and some Punisher stuff, and uh -huh. that's what sort of segued into me meeting Mike Mignola because he needed a colorist on a project, and I was considered one of the better colorists. Right. Was that the Bram Stoker Dracula? No, it was um, Walt Simonson wrote this Wolverine graphic novel, something jungle, like jungle tales, jungle something, you know, uh -huh. Wolverine in the jungle. And Mike drew it, Mignola drew it, and uh, Mike asked me to color it, and I did. I, it was Again, it was on blue line, so it was kind of painted color. Uh -huh. and, and we really hit it off. We had a lot of and, and we worked together for quite a few years after that. No, oh, that's awesome. So that's kind of how that started that relationship up. And why did you leave Marvel? Like, what year was that? Was that like uh, early 90s at some point, right? Like, was it 91 or so, 92? When and why did you leave Marvel? Yeah, definitely late 80s, early 90s. Um, I think I wanted to be a freelancer. I, you know, uh, I, I was asked several times by DeFalco and Mark Rumwald if I wanted to come on as an editor there. And I kind of didn't really. I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to try my hand at, well, okay, can I do this? Mm -hmm. You know, when I was young and dumb and having fun being in New York. And like I said, you'd go up to the, to the office and I met my best friend, Jack Morelli up there, who, who was a big Marvel letterer, letterer at the time. And we would hang out and, you know, you're young, you're really not looking at your career very much. So like, where, where should it go? Uh -huh. Which is a good segue to what my next question is, which is where did you go next? Was it, you did a few projects with Minola at that point, besides what you had done with Marvel, you, you did the Bram Stoker's Dracula in 1992 for, that was for Tops, right? That was Tops. Yeah. Tops were purely known as a, as a trading card, baseball card, non-sports card company. And they wanted to get, cause comics were really, that's what that was the Jim Lee Liefeld image days and comics were the thing. And Tops wanted to get, you know, start their own imprint of comics. And I don't know how I, I so the first book they signed on was with Mike to adapt, this is four or six issues, to adapt uh, Francis Ford Coppola's movie Dracula. And mm -hmm. he did a beautiful job. And then now IDW just re-released that. And Mike asked me to color it, and I did. And, I, you know, I, I'm always on time, and I'm, you know, I'd like to think I'm fairly pleasant to work with. So I hit it off with one of the big shots at Tops, this guy named Ira Friedman. And I started sort of consulting with him, you know, like, Hey, who should we hire to be our editor in chief? And, you know, he'd ask me all these questions. So yeah. And, and, and you know, unfortunately Tops was fairly short lived as a comic publisher, but they did right. pretty fun stuff. Yeah. yeah. That, right. uh, that Dracula really has some, I think more import than people realized at the time. It's, it has some staying power because it's great. Mignola. I mean, he, I think he really, evolves during that period really quickly because that's everything that that uh, Hellboy is. It's right there in that book. I had a question about the re-release. Did you look at the black and white version that came out? I picked it up at a comic shop. I, they were going to send me a couple copies and I'm really good friends with Scott Dunbeer at IDW and he said, oh, I'll send you a bunch. And I'm like, God, I got way too many comics in my house. Just, you know, please don't send it to me. But uh, <laughs> Scott had asked me to because that was that was actually pre-computer. That was like the very end of right before everybody was coloring comics on computer. That was that was color guides where you you would color on Xeroxes photocopies, right. and you'd have to code every color. God, it was a pain in the ass. 
So he asked me, hey, you know, we're going to re-release this. And I'm like, oh, Jesus, the coloring's awful on that. You know, it's so clunky. It, it's, you know, he said, well, if you want to tweak the colors, for, you know, I'd send you the files and you could just kind of like, you know, recolor it or tweak what's there. And I'm like, yeah, that'll be cool. And I did like, and again, I was working at DC at the time. This was just a year ago, a year and a half ago. And I was like, yeah, oh no, I'll recolor the entire thing. And you don't, I won't charge you, no problem. And then I started doing it and I was like, what the fuck did I just get myself into? Yeah, you know, charge for that. It's like, well, <laughs> you know, I, unfortunately I had to have the, the phone call, but I had to say, man, I, Scott, I just can't do this. I just don't have the time to do this. I have a full-time job. And he had right. a study, one of the great guys. Right, right. Yeah, I, I think so. You so at some point you just and and that's why they decided to put it out in black and white instead. Well, it, uh, I think you know Mike's Mike's the master of black and white, uh, so they I know they wanted to release it in black and white, and then the color one just came out. So I think they were had always planned to re-release both versions of it. Oh, I see. Yeah, I thought it was weird that 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 came out in black and white, and From Hell is coming out now in color. And it's like, do you have any feeling about that in terms of if it's drawn with the notion that it's going to be colored, is that different for an artist than if they know it's going to be released in black and white? Man, that's an interesting question. Every artist is different. Again, Mike Mignola is the master of black and white. I can't think of anybody in the history of comics that comes close to him. And that's quite a grand statement, but... I love seeing Mike stuff in black and white. You know, Mike has over the years has given me a few pieces of original art. And man, I, you know, I loved coloring Mike's stuff. It was really fun. And Dave Stewart, who colors most of Mike's stuff now, does an incredible job. One of the great colors. Oh, we're going to talk about Dave Stewart when we get to solo. Oh, okay. okay. I mean, I don't know. What do you think? Do you like seeing the black and white stuff? Yeah, I think it really depends on, on the artist. I know I've looked at the, the From Hell stuff. And it's being done so carefully and so great. At the same time, it's like, I just, I think it's what you see first sticks in your mind and it's hard to go to a different one sometimes. Yep. You know, true. that's it's what like I Blade Runner, you know, everybody cries about the narration in Blade Runner, but that's the way I first saw it. So that's, yep. that's what Blade Runner should be. That's right. Once it imprints, it's very hard to get it out of your, uh, out of your head, no matter what. So you also did a Legends of Dark Knight with Mignola as well in 1993 at the same time that you did the, the Houdini book that Alex is going to talk about. But the next, in 1994, that was a huge deal because there you did the one that everybody knows, which is you colored the Hellboy book, uh, Seed of Destruction. Now, how essential were your coloring choices to what has become, you know, such a, a known book. I mean, it's not like you said to Mignola, hey, why don't we make him red, right? Yeah. <laughs> there was there was already a notion of what he looked like, or did you how much did you contribute to all of that? Well, I'll call it Cor- Corny Star Mike and I were very close pals. He had moved to Brooklyn and we lived down the street and we used to go to lunch and I remember he um you know, that was home freelancing and he was home freelancing. So we would meet down the street at the diner all the time. And he, take, he took out his sketchbook and he said, literally said, hey, I just came up with a new character. I'll show you my drawing. I call him Hellboy. And I looked at him and I said, Mike, that's the dumbest fucking thing I've ever seen. <laughs> and I think I was probably wrong on that, you know, and he asked me about that all the time. But um, he asked me to color it and he gave me, you know, and I'm kind of, you know, I don't like working with my friends and, you know, I always get fights with my friends and that you work with. And, and we actually, unfortunately, we did end up getting in a big fight a couple of years later, but we made up. But, uh, oh, okay. You know, Mike really wanted me to color it and I was sort of on the fence and, and he gave me this gorgeous Kevin Nolan original cover from a Batman. I forget which Batman book, you know, he said, I'm giving you this, but you have to color Hellboy. And I was like, yeah, Kevin Nolan, shit. I'll, okay, you got a deal. So, um, you know, he start, had started working on a couple pages and he showed me, you know, the character design. And I said, I think we should make him red. And Mike looked at me and literally said, gee, you fucking think? You know, <laughs> so, yeah, okay, Mike was always going to make him red. But I think I was officially the first person to say that. So I like <laughs> cocktail parties. I like to say I'm the guy that made Hellboy red. There you go. That's pretty cool. That's funny. All right, Mike, so Mike, Alex, Mike knew exactly um, what he was doing. I mean, you know, Mike really, you know, and Mike would, and, you know, those early days, Mike would, so we would go through the drawings and Mike would go, 
you know, like rifle through the drawings and say, okay, I paid seven. That's got to be nighttime, not daytime. And then he'd go through another 10 pages and go, oh, make that little thing yellow. But the, his notes were incredibly light. So, you know, what you saw on those pages was really my color. No, oh, that's awesome. So shortly after or close to that time, you also worked on Batman Houdini, The Devil's Workshop. And that was 1993. It was written by Howard Chaikin and John Francis Moore. So how did you come to that project? I, somebody introduced me to Chaikin. And he scared the shit out of me right from right from the get go. Yeah, <laughs> he's a pretty daunting guy. He's uh-huh. way too. He's the smartest guy in the room always. Yeah, but we we became friendly, and I said to him, "Hey, I want to do this character. I'd love for you to write it. I want to draw it." There was a character. I forget the name of the company, Canadian company. I think the character was with Mister X, called Mister X, and. Uh-huh. I really love the character in the first couple issues. The, the you're you're talking Mr. X, the Dean Motter? Yeah. From Vortex that, that Hernandez started on? Oh, that's great. I yeah. And it it's, totally carries over a little bit to Terminal City when you're doing those covers. But yeah, I, I was a huge fan of that book. Yeah, I mean, again, that was that time. I think that was that time period of, you know, Love and Rockets and the, and the Rocketeer that, was, that stuff came out. I just love, there was something about the character I loved, you know, it was that, film noir and kind of science fiction-y, weird dream state kind of thing. And I went to Howard and I said, hey, let's do this character. And he's like, yeah, totally, we can do it. I've got some great ideas. But then we just couldn't get the rights to it. And I was, I tried and I tried and I tried. And, uh-huh. you know, um, so then, I, you know, plan B was either Howard said to me or I said to Howard, well, let's do Batman instead. Let's make some money instead of do Batman. So he was, his writing partner at the time was John Moore, really good writer. And so the three of us did that, yeah. Oh, did cool. Batman. And again, I'm a big history fan, so I said, you know, man, I'm a real big magic fan. I'd love to do something with Houdini. So Howard just put it in his brain. Ah, that's awesome. So in illustrating that book, what were your influences on that book, and what kind of uh, aesthetic were you going for? I loved it. I actually reread it the other day. Tell us a little bit about your, your visual construction of that book. Man, I try not to think about that book. I... <laughs> My ex-wife and I moved up to Boston. She was going to Harvard for her master's. So we moved all the way up to Boston from New York. And right at the time where I got the contract to do Batman Houdini, and man, 64 pages, again, you get the script and you're like, holy shit, I have to draw this thing. How am I going to possibly do this? So you get the script and you kind of freak out. I'm not a comic book artist. I'm an illustrator. So like the first page is, a, is an establishing shot of the flower building in New York at, on 23rd Street. Well, I can draw that. I can paint that. I know how. I know what that should look like. So I did this. I did the first page, fully painted, watercolors, and I had been feeling kind of crappy for a couple of weeks. I was getting really bad headaches, and so I did the one page. But I was on the road to okay. I, I guess I could probably pull this off. And I went. You know, my wife at the time said, "You're getting these headaches. Let's go to the doctor." And so we went to the doctor that afternoon. The doctor ran MRIs and CAT scans, and sure, oh, okay. brain tumor. Wait, so, that you had a you did have a brain tumor. I had a brain tumor, yeah. So oh, okay. I fortunately was in Boston, and so I went to Boston Mass General, which is a great is a great hospital. Uh-huh. And you know, and it all they did the operation, blah blah blah. You know, I recuperated. That's twenty five years ago. So uh, it was like a benign glioma type deal. Exactly, exactly. But it was pretty rough. You know, I mean, they have to enter your skull and all that stuff. But yeah, cra- yeah, the craniotomy, like, sure. Exactly, yeah. Not to get off on a weird tangent, but the point is, so I. I had started that Batman book and I didn't get back to it for almost a year because I recuperation for that is six, eight months at the mm-hmm. least, mm-hmm. you know, but I, you know, what's funny is God, I hadn't thought about this. I remember I finished the page. I finished that first page and it came out good. And I turned to put it next to me on the table and there was an exacto blade, an exacto knife next to me. And I jabbed it right in my finger by mistake. Uh, you know, being a clot, I just went, oh, and I was bleeding all over the place. And I took the original, the painting, the original piece of art, and I wiped my finger on the back of it. And there was uh, a big blood stain on the back of it. Uh, so, you know, when I found that page just maybe like three months ago in my flat files, and I'm like, yeah, the blood's still on the back of that. And I think it was a symbol for what was to come for the next year. Oh, wow. That's wow. a pretty, that, that's pretty dramatic that's imagery. Story, but I yeah. Uh huh. No, I like it. I mean, it's interesting. So you received a lot of notice and accolades for that. So um, you do describe that there was some struggle as far as the difference between illustration 
of one image and then sequential storytelling of a series of images. But I think a lot of people felt like you really hit it, you really hit it out of the ballpark. So was it from notice of your achievement with that, that then you became part of DC staff or, or were you a freelancer for a while? What was that transition as far as job title over at DC? I was so unhappy with what I did on that book, the way I, my stuff came out on that, that uh-huh. I'm like, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not going to be an artist. You know, I've got to look for a real job. I just, I can't, you know, cause I was so hard on myself, you know, and which a lot of artists are, but I was ridiculous about it. Like I'm just, you know, I'm a laughing stock. I'm a charlatan. People are going to just think I'm an awful artist. Uh, huh. And right at that time, I got a call from a guy at DC Comics named Neil Posner, who unfortunately has passed away since. You know, and he said, hey, you know, the coloring at DC Comics, you're one of the best colors. The coloring at DC Comics is really in awful shape. We're just transitioned over to using computers and the separators are terrible. Would you come on and be our color editor? And I'm like, Neil, there's no such thing as color editor in comics. And he goes, yeah, you'd be the first color editor. In, in <laughs> and I said, yeah, okay, I'll do it. And I took the job and stayed at DC for 26 years. What year was that? Was that like, it was in the 90s? But what, what do you think what year closely was that? I remember my first, I don't, again, I'm terrible with dates because I'm an artist and math is hard. I remember my first week at DC. Batman Houdini was on the printing press. I went up to Canada to see it printed. So whenever Batman Houdini came out was when I first started. It's 93, I think. Yeah, yeah that sounds uh, right. So that's when you became staff and color editor. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, I was color editor for like two years. And then I really hit it off with, you know, the people I was working with and Paul Levitz, who was running the show. Uh-huh. Um, so he kind of made me art director. Yeah. Pretty quick, and that's, pretty that's art and design director, right? Well, I was, I was color editor, then I was art director, then I was art and design director, and then I was art director, design director, and collected edition editor, director uh-huh. at the end there. I see. Yeah, that's an interesting sequence. But you also worked on covers in the, in the 90s, too, and you edited some projects at DC, right, during this time. Like in 1995, you did Vigilante covers, and I think a lot of people would say you captured the Western genre well, and the layouts were great. Those uh, were great. The covers, the covers on that are super memorable. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. So you did uh, still do some drawing, even though you were focusing on color and directing and art directing. So how did you get into those covers? Was it like people just needed a cover and you just filled it in? Or were, were you like, you know, I'd really like to do the covers for that? How did that work? I never once in all those years asked for a gig. I never said, hey, can I, I think you're doing a new Batman. Can I do the co-? I refused to do that. I thought that, was, that would be kind of shitty, but. Uh-huh. You know, I was full time at DC, so it was five days a week, and it was a pretty exhausting job. But people would ask me to do artwork all the time. You know, people who not because they saw me in the hall, but they actually liked my work, so they say, "Hey, Mark, you want to do this these covers?" And once in a while, I would say yes. You know, but I found it really hard to juggle both both jobs. Uh, yeah. So you yeah, turn yeah. down a lot of stuff. I mean, is there anything where somebody asked you to do a cover that you wish you had done it? Yeah, I did um I did a series of covers for this book called Johnny Double that Vertigo put out. Yeah, I love those. And Eduardo it was Eduardo Riso's first American comics that he drew. And I think it was four four or six issues. Four or six covers. And Axel Alonso, who was the editor, really at Vertigo at the time, really liked them a lot and asked me he said, Hey, uh Eduardo Riso really likes your stuff too. He's doing a new book with Brian Azzarello called 100 Bullets. We'd love for you to do the covers. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Uh, yeah, awesome. What's it about? Well, they have 100 issues planned. And I was like, whoa, 100 (laughs) issues and a full-time job. And so I said, I'd love to do it, but I just can't. I just can't pull it off. It's too much. And I recommended Dave Johnson for the gig. And Dave, who's like 80 times better an artist than I am, from a business standpoint, I made the right decision. But I am kind of jealous that I turned it down because it would have been a really fun job to have. Yeah. Oh, that's great. And there's other covers, right? Terminal City covers. In both series, you, you had provided covers for both both series of that. And the architecture was awesome. Johnny Double covers. Um, you had great camera angles, cinematic. So are, are, are movies, like cinematography and movies, does that factor into your layouts of these of covers? I would probably say yes. I'm a big movie nut. I think, you know, the stuff we watch, the movies, 
that we watch, the TV shows we watch, they all make such an impression on us. And I like to tap into that as a, you know, as an artist, I like to tap into that. You know, I'll watch a, I'll watch a Netflix show that's awful, but the cinematography is usually really good. And you'll say, oh my God, look how beautiful that shot is. I think most artists are like that, you know, from Frank Miller to Kinsale to, to Mike Mignola, we're all, we're all movie nuts. Movie nuts, yeah. And I just want to say, it's not just like cinematography, but I, I, in looking at that Johnny Double and, and some of the other things that you do, I see some Saul Bass influence as well. Oh, I love Saul Bass. Yeah, I, I just, I'm such a big fan. There was a German artist named Ludwig Holwein, who I really love his stuff. He, he unfortunately worked, worked during the Nazi days, and but his imagery was gorgeous, you know, and he wasn't a Nazi. But, it, you know, that really influenced me quite a bit, his work. I see. Uh huh. Oh, that's interesting. So now, turning to Batman, Batman seems to be very linked with your career at DC. So, tell us about starting the Batman Black and White books in 1996. You know, I'd be working at DC, and I'd be the art director, and I was, you know, overlooking a lot of the art, picking young, you know, meeting young artists, and getting new talent, and everything that the job involved it was a full time job. But Paul Levitz or you know, or Dan DiDio would every now and then they'd say, hey. You know, we want you to edit something. Why don't you come up with a special project? Right. Um, so I pitched this book. I figured I was a really big fan of the old black and white creepy and eerie, you know, the Warren stuff. Yep. Which Jim mentioned earlier, the Ditko stuff. You know, I, I really love anthologies, and I'm dumb enough to think that everybody loves anthologies. So I figured, okay, so if you have an anthology and you have the greatest character ever in comics, Batman, and you hire the best artists and writers... It's got to be a hit. It's just, it's a no-brainer. Right. And I pitched it to Paul, and Paul was like, well, you know, we don't really have success with black and white comics. And I think the one they had done previously was, the most recent one was a John Byrne, I want to say OMAC, black and white. Yep. Series. Yeah. Yeah. There's four issues of that, yeah. Yeah, and John, who's, you know, who, who's an incredible artist, has an incredibly big following. It sold good for, you know, it's it sold good because John's, reputation carried it along, but it didn't sell what they wanted it to sell. Right. So like a, like a moron, I went and pleaded and cried, and, you know, and, and told Paul Levitz I was, I would wash his car for a year and stuff. And, huh. you know, and he finally acquiesced and he, he let me do it. And it became a popular, incredibly successful series. Yeah. They, you know, we eventually did, uh, started doing statues, Batman black and white statues through DC collectibles. And they just did their 100th, I'm pretty proud of that. And all of the great artists and writers I got to work with, that's really, man, that's one of the highlights of my life for sure. Yeah, it's great. And you also edited Batman Ego by Darwin Cook. And that was Darwin's first major work. Is that is that correct? Yeah, pretty much. I'll tell a long story really, really quickly, if I may. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I would, uh, in the mornings, I'd go have cup coffee with a good friend of mine, Scott Peterson, who was, Working in the Batman office, he was, he and Denny O'Neill worked together. So I'd sit with Scott in the morning, we'd have coffee, I'd buy him a coffee, and I'd go sit and chat. And I bought him a coffee and one more. And he had in the corner of his office, he had this stack of manila envelopes that was literally five feet tall. It was just jammed, you know, it was just, like if you looked at it, it would have, it would have fallen over. It was so many, I said, what's all this crap? And, and, well, those are submissions that my mom to be the guy who goes through our submissions. Mm-hmm. And he's like, but I just can't bring myself to do it. He's like, why don't you take them? And I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't think I'm gonna. There were all those, you know, those manila envelopes and towards the very bottom was a black envelope. And I said, Hey, watch this, you know, and I, you know, that trick where the magician pulls the tablecloth off of the table and all the, the plates and glasses stay where they were. Right. Oh, you did that with the black envelope. I did that with the black envelope. I pulled it at all of the, all of those submissions, all those envelopes went flying all over his office. <laughs> and he had to pick those up. And I ran out of the office with my black envelope as a joke. <laughs> and I got back to my office and I actually, I'm not making this story up. It's I, I, verbatim. It, I swear it happened. So I sat in my office with this black envelope and I opened it up. Oh, I wonder what this is. And most submissions you get at Marvel and DC and the big companies, they're really not that great. You know, they're always earnestly drawn and, but there's not much talent there. And this was, this was, was this incredible pitch for a Batman story that had illustrations, you know, um, pitch illustrations and, you know, and the synopsis for the story. And I literally sat there and read it and I looked around the office like, 
how is this possible? This is incredible. <laughs> right. So I looked at it, and it, was, it had the guy's name and phone number, and it was some guy named some guy in Canada named Darwin Cook. So I picked up the phone, and I called this guy Darwin Cook. And I got him, and he was really kind of like, or he was sort of like a bit surprised that someone was calling him from D.C. Mm-hmm. And I said, I, you know, I want to publish this thing. Uh, you know, I'd have to run it through channel, but I think we'd go for this. Would you want to do it? And he said, oh, shit, I just, he said, I'm moving to California like in two weeks. I just took a job with Bruce Tim at Warner Brothers Animation to work on the Batman cartoon. Uh, he said, but when I'm done, I would really love to do it. So, well, you know, that's what happened. He went and worked with, with Bruce, with the genius Bruce. And, uh, and then we did Ego right after that, when he got back. Ah, uh, that's awesome. And did you, so you realized right away how good he was, it sounds like. Man. You knew it, dude. You knew it right away. You know, his, you know, people love his artwork, but, and I worked, I ended up working with Dora on quite a few projects, but to me, you know, I love his artwork too, but I think he's even a better writer than an artist. I think he's one of the great, great, great writers in in comics history. I really, really do. Uh huh. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to ask you about New Frontier in a few minutes because it's one of my favorite superhero books of all time. So let's see. Now, Batman Hush. You know, that was in the issue 608 to 619 in 2002. It has its own animated movie now. You introduced Loeb and Jeff Loeb and uh, Jim Lee together and got it started. Isn't that correct? Yeah, yeah, it is. They uh, they knew each other. They were both really big shots in the comics industry. And Mm -hmm. um, they knew each other. And God, it's a long story. I apologize. Um, That's okay. We love long uh, stories. And by the way, I'm still speeding on coffee, so I know I'll speed through the story. Uh, <laughs> you know, DC, Warner Brothers bought Wildstorm. Jim came over, you see him, Warner Brothers, and did Jim's incredible job, you know, running stuff and, and uh, you know, all the, the many hats that Jim was wearing and does wear. But, I, you know, being friendly with Paul Levitz, I knew that Paul really wanted Jim to also draw for DC. You know, he wanted him to be a in managerial, but he also wanted, and as an art director for a lot of stuff, but he also wanted Jim to draw some stuff. Uh-huh. But Paul felt he, you know, I guess, and I may be totally reading, I've always read into this, but I think Paul never wanted to actually ask Jim to do it, you know, to, hey, could you also draw for us too? You know, I, for some reason, he just didn't want to go there. I don't know uh-huh. why. Uh huh. You could figure out the psychology of that, I'm sure. So I'm like an idiot. One day, you know, I come out to California once in a while to do business, and I found myself in, I was having lunch with Jeff, who I had worked with through Tim Sale. I was having, I was having breakfast with Jeff, and I, we had a great breakfast, we were chatting, and I said, man, I gotta tell you, I was talking to Jim Lee, and he just reveres your work. He thinks you're the best writer in comics. He would, he said he would love to do something with you, but he, he's kind of, you know, he's kind of like shy about it, he doesn't want to ask you, you know? Uh-huh. And you sort of see, you sort of saw it on Jeff's face. Hmm, interesting. Because yeah. Jim Lee is Jim Lee, right? And then, like, four hours later, I was in Jim's office when I was in uh, La Jolla, San Diego, at Wildstorm before they moved. I was in Jim's office talking business, and I said, you know. And by the way, what I said to Jeff was bullshit. I, I never talked to Jim about <laughs> Jeff. I just, right. I just thought I'd be, you know, Machiavellian, and, and, you know, I am Sicilian, so that kind of goes. Uh, yeah. You know, and I did the same exact thing to Jim. I said to him, hey, you know, Jeff Lowe really loves your stuff. They both stopped for uh-huh. it. And my work there was done. You know, they they got like, I think they had like four issues in the can before they even started publishing the book. It was really, it uh-huh. was really kind of cool. You know, I'm real proud of that. because That is cool. You know, at that time, people were so really questioning whether comic books, periodicals were going to exist because... Everybody wanted to do graphic novels and special format stuff. And I love comics. You know, I love the periodicals. I hope they're always around. And I was, I'm really proud of that Jim and Jeff's Hush book really kind of reinvigorated the monthly comic book to a a degree. Right. There's a lot of excitement about that story. Yeah. Yeah. And then a lot of, you know, a lot of artists and writers said, wow, that's cool. I want to, I want to draw comics too. I want to write regular comics too. Yeah, that's right. All right, so I'm going to I'm going to go off script for a couple of minutes and just sort of nerd out on a few things I wanted to ask you, and then get back on track. Can we talk about Alex Toast for a few minutes? Sure, because he you were actually friends with him, weren't you? 
very good friends, yeah, for about 15, 16 years. Yeah, see, that's special. I mean, you know, because not everybody has, certainly doesn't have that duration of friendship with him. Talk about that. How did, when did you guys become friends? Right after college, uh, George Brand, who I've mentioned, said to me, uh, he knew I was a toast nut because he was too. And we, you know, oh, did you ever see this comic? Did you ever see that comic? George said, you know, you can write to Toth. He lives in California and he loves corresponding with people. He's not big on the phone, but if you write him a letter, I bet you he would write you back. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh my God, really? So I wrote a letter. I wrote this, you know, this ridiculous fanboy, you know, dear Mr. Toth, you're God. And I worship, you know, I, I'm sure it was awful, but he wrote back to me on a postcard. He was really notorious for his postcards. He would write in really small print on the back, really this very neat print on the back of the postcard. And he wrote, uh, I really liked your letter. I'm sure I'd love to correspond with you. Let's, you know, send me another long letter, kiddo, and we'll chat about stuff. And wow. It was, it was a good friendship. I mean, it really, you know, yeah, Alex is really famous for being kind of bipolar and, you know, turning on his friends eventually, which happened to me to a degree. Mm-hmm. But I had, a, I had a lot of good years in there. He would do the coolest thing. If he sent you a postcard, if you, you know, you got a postcard in the mail, which I have, I saved, I have all of them. I have hundreds of them, but he'd write you letters too. And he'd write it on a, on stationery. And what he would do is he always kept a sketchbook, but like, like the kind your mom has just like smaller white paper that you rip a page out and you send it. So he would, he would have dozens of those that he would just all day long, he would sit and sketch in and draw, do these drawings. And so when he would send me a letter in an envelope, he would take, you know, five, 10, 20 of those pages and fold them and put them in with the letter. Uh, so I've got, I've got, Jesus, I'd say, I'd say 300 of those sketch pages. Uh-huh. Um, I put them in a portfolio and I looked, I looked through this portfolio and I'm just like, how lucky was I that I knew this guy? Right. You know, like my artistic hero. I, I was friends with this guy. Yeah. Wow. He's the best. I mean, he's, he's my favorite of, I mean, I, he's just the most interesting, innovative one. And, you know, I wish he had a bigger following. Have you ever thought of doing anything with that, with that work, making it accessible to other people? You know, I have a pal down in North Carolina, a guy named John Hitchcock also corresponded with him. And he, John did put a book together of all the sketches he had. And I thought about it. And one of my very best friends, a guy out here named Ruben Procopio, sweetest guy on the planet. He was really, really, really good friends with Toth because he lived in the same town. So he would go take Toth groceries and they were, they were incredibly close. And when Alex passed away, Alex had, so I remember going, I'm sorry, I'm back up for a second. Uh-huh. I remember going over, I, I would go visit Alex once a year after San Diego con, I would drive up to LA and then go spend the day with Alex. And it was, it was nine, 10 hours sitting on his couch. Just oh, that's cool. Every- it was like, oh my God, you, you're sitting with God. It was bizarre. And, you know, and he was really knowledgeable about every topic under the sun. And I remember one time he had this portfolio by the side of this table. His house, he lived in the Hollywood Hills, this gorgeous house. But he had one of those, por- you know, those portfolios that are sort of like boxes, you know, like they're, yeah. they're rectangular, right. but there's the hinges and you open the top and the top opens up. Mm-hmm. He had this art portfolio, like leaning against the coffee table, like, and the first four or five times I went, I kind of kept eyeballing it and it always stayed in the corner on the table. And one day I said, Alex, you know, I, I really want to look in that portfolio. Let me look. He, <laughs> and he laughed. And he said, yeah, go ahead. And he had all this stuff in the portfolio that was never published work, you know, stories that he had started and drawn maybe four pages of and then given up on or stuff that no one had ever seen. And it was just, it was really cool to look through. And, you know, and I, when I was done, I put it away and I thanked him. But when he passed, Ruben got that portfolio and he still has it to this day. And Ruben and I always talk about, man, we should publish that stuff. Cause we're both still very close friends with Alex's kids. And I'm sure they would let us do it. And the profits would go to them, obviously. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, oh, I would I love to see that. Well, I thought it would be really cool. I and mean, maybe I will, you know, maybe I'll get around to it someday. I thought it'd be cool to publish that stuff in a nice, over, slightly oversight book. But then if I were to take one of those sketchbook pages and tip it in to the front of each copy uh-huh. and, you know, and sell it for more. And again, the money would go to the Toe Kid. 
you know, like a deluxe version of it. That way you'd get this cool book, but you'd also get an original Alex Toast drawing in it. Uh-huh. Uh, I, I will like start this. saving now for that. <laughs> I'll send you one for free. How's that? There you go. Uh-huh. I would, I would take it. Wow. Yeah. I, 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 you know, I would love to eventually do that. I mean, because what's going to happen to that stuff? I'm going to look through it every now and then and get a lot of joy from it and then sell it eventually. I'd rather, I'd rather people have it, you know? Yeah. I am yeah. so glad I asked you that question. That This is so fun for me to listen to you tell this story. That's just great. A couple other I'm things. You're, I'm glad you're a Toast fan. I love when people say Alex because so many people say Jack Kirby. Oh yeah. But, but Toast wasn't, you know, all tied up in superheroes either. I love that story where Kirby had Toast come over for like a barbecue and they sat there and neither one of them knew at all what the other one was talking about yeah, in terms of, yeah. of their methods. Yeah, I'm sort of being, I'm sort of being, that story's being attributed to me because I did that on the, I think it was on the uh, Alex Pope documentary, uh, you know, but I kind of don't want to tell the same stories over and over again, but man, that story <laughs> cracked me up. You yeah, can, I thought it's hilarious. Can you, can you not picture Jack Kirby and Alex Pope sitting in totes, I mean, in Kirby's backyard at the swimming pool? Can you picture those two titans talking about comic books? Holy shit. Yeah, huge. I would like to see a reenactment of that just with, I mean, like, yeah, because it's such a, it's, it's such a, a visual moment and it, it, the fun of writing that dialogue, it would just be great. It really yeah. would. So there's a few, a few things that came out over DC that I wondered if you had your fingerprints on to some degree, just because I thought they were such visual treats. One was after 50, after 52, the series came out, the release of the covers book, which was so well packaged. And so I normally, I wouldn't have thought I would ever buy just that book of covers, but those were magnificent week after week. Did you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I was good friends with J.G. Jones, who when I lived in New Jersey, he lived in the next town over a week hang out a lot and he would always have it he was one of those guys that one of those artists that always had a sketchbook with him like always and he would show me you know these the little sketches for he was doing i guess it was well it was 52 covers in a row one a yeah. week for 50 for a whole year it's amazing God, well, it's amazing and, and the amazing the obviously obviously the amazing thing about that is the quality of this of each of these covers was so oh my god he, he killed it he really nailed it and to do one a week for a year is just an impossible task. So I, uh, you know, so I called him and we, we were chatting on the phone and he said, I'm going to pitch doing a book of collecting all these covers and all your little sketches. He goes, yeah, I'd love to do that. And then like an hour later, Dan DeDeal walked in my office and said, hey, we should do a book collecting all of JG's covers. And I was like, <laughs> well, that's a good idea. We'll do that. And then the editor, I, I apologize, I forget who the editor was. The next day he said, hey, we should do a book of all JG's covers. So... Again, yes, it was my idea, but I didn't take credit for it. Mm. Awesome. We've talked about Darwin a little bit, and we're going to talk about him more. But that 2014, the um, variant cover month where he did all of those, that was fantastic. I mean, those define those characters and DC of the period where I fell in love with it better than anything I can think of. Was that something you had anything to do with? Yeah, I asked, I asked Darwin to do those. That was my idea. Because I was running the, for the last, I've been out of, away from D.C. From, for about six months now. But for the last, like, five years, I ran D.C.'s variant cover, variant covers, cover program. And, you know, at first it was themes like Selfie Month and Mad Magazine, Alfred E. Newman meets the D.C. Superheroes Month, you know. And I was sort of running out of ideas. And I thought, well, why don't we do artist month, you know, where one artist does all 25 variant covers. And Darwin was the first guy I asked, and, you know, because I just love his work. And I agree with you. I, those images are so iconic, mm-hmm. so graphically creative. And again, he did, he drew 25 covers, I'd say maybe in a month and a half. Right. And so many of those will be in my brain, like, forever i mean they the same way that some of those 52 ones were they're just so well conceived and they're just they're just so solid that they don't go away boy there's so many of those in that particular cover run i mean those those are just fantastic yeah totally agree Mm. Um, you know darwin without getting off into darwin too much darwin is a really complex guy a lot like tote 
he had his flaws as a human being, but he could be the sweetest guy you've ever met. But he could be the biggest asshole you ever met too, you know. Mm. But you know, look, we all have our demons. But man, I love that guy. I miss him. You know, I think I think he's. And you're probably getting a sense. I'm really prone to grand statements like, "Oh, so and so is the best comic book artist." I think I really, I really feel honestly that Darwin was the the best writer slash artist of all of you know of all comics history. Uh-huh. Uh, he understood iconics. You know, some people say, oh, he was, he was kind of retro. He wasn't retro at all. He was epic. He understood iconic imagery and iconic storytelling. And he got to the core of these characters. Look, when I, like I said, when I was a kid, I loved Marvel. Spider-Man is still my favorite character. Maybe a tie with Batman these days. But, you know, I was the Marvel nut. And I came over to work for DC. And I kind of didn't understand many of DC's characters. Like the Flash, he runs fast. Big deal. Who cares? You know? Oh, green arrow. Oh, yeah. He shoots an arrow. Big fucking deal. Who cares? But man, working with Darwin on New Frontier, he showed me, he made me see the power of those characters, you know, and why so many fans love Green Lantern. I had, man, as a Marvel fan, give me the Hulk, give me Captain America, give me the Fantastic Four. I just didn't understand Green Lantern. But man, I totally get Green Lantern now. Because of Darwin. Because he went, he understood it. In a single panel, he could make you like Wonder Woman if you had never appreciated that character in your whole life. And he would draw her on that table. And suddenly it's like, oh, yeah, she's badass. I suddenly get Wonder Woman. Or that panel where Robin is jumping up and down while Batman's talking to to Superman. And it's like, that's Dick Grayson. Yeah, it, He had such an incredible instinct about it. It's just amazing. Well, he had respect for these characters. You're absolutely right. He had respect for these characters. He didn't want to shit on these characters and make Green Lantern an alcoholic. And right. Oh, uh, yeah. Let's retrofit the back history of these characters. He always went to the core of the creation of the characters. Mm-hmm. Right. Like Flash game. running to Vegas because of Captain Cold. And he just, that's brilliant. Yeah. Oh, and he based that Captain Cold on Grant Morrison, by the way. If you look closely, it's Grant Morrison. Huh. No, really? <laughs> oh, that's yeah. awesome. That's, that is cool. Yeah, but I loved working with him. I really, man, you know, I really loved working with that guy. I had called him not that long ago, I guess a year, year and a half ago, two years ago, whatever it was. We had talked, I had come up with an idea, one of my cookie ideas for a project, and he loved it years ago. He loved it. He really wanted to do it. He thought it was a brilliant idea, great idea. We were going to do it. Then we had this really big fight. We had this really big falling out. Again, because Darwin was Darwin, you know, and Hmm. And I'm perfect, so I'm sure it wasn't my fault. But there you go. <laughs> um, you know, he really wanted to do it, and then we had that big fight. So we, so I forgot it for like three years, four years, whatever it was. And then about a year and a half ago, we had, we made up. You know, we became friends again, and everything was cool. And about a year and a half ago, I called him and I said, "Hey, time to do that Batman book we talked about." And I apologize, I'm getting a little emotional about it, but you know, he said, uh, "You know, I can't." And I was kind of like. What do you mean you can't? Come on, it's a great idea. And I got a little, I got a, I didn't show it to him on the phone, but I got a little pissed off and like, well, why the fuck not? Come on, man, you know? Right. And he's like, I just, I just can't do it. I really want to do it. I can't do it. And, you know, and then, you know, the next like three days later, he called me back and he told me oh. why he couldn't do it, why he couldn't do it, and, you know? Because of medical. I, I, apologize. I apologize. I'm getting a little emotional here, but yeah, because he was, he knew what was going to happen to him. Yeah. Well, whew, well, all right. <laughs> that, yeah. That's hard. Boy, I just brought down the room. No, that's okay. I mean, it, I like the backstory. I think Jim does too. I, I think everybody knows that loss. I mean, you know, I mean, and you knew it personally, but comics knew it because he was, he was, he was the, for, I think a whole generation He's that guy that, you know, that, that maybe older people had with Kirby or with Steranko at some point or with, with different people. Cook was that guy. He was that level. And you don't get those very often. Very um, rarely. Very rarely. Right. So you'll see artists, you know, you'll see artists and writers who are, who are as, are as talented as him, but there was something special. Like, look, Adam Hughes, I always say he's the best draftsman I've ever worked with. The guy can draw anything. But there was something just, you're right, there was something that was a throwback to Jack Kirby with Darwin. Mm-hmm. Well, you, on those Hughes covers that he did for Wonder Woman especially, you look like you were having such a good time 
with him on on those. They were fun, yeah. They were fun. I was at um, I was at a convention. I was at Sheldon Drum's great convention in uh, in Charlotte, Heroes Con, and uh, what years ago? And I always wanted to work with that and use because I loved his stuff. And there's that. Oh, there's Adam over there. I'm going to go talk to him. And I was like, um, excuse me, we don't know each other, you know. But he he knew who I was, you know. And and I said, I'd love for you to draw some covers for me at DC. And he kind of like. That could be fun. I, I'd like to do that. And, well, you know, he said, well, what character are you thinking of? And I said, well, how about Wonder Woman? And, man, you could see he couldn't contain his glee that I asked him to do Wonder Woman because huh. that's what he wanted to ask to do, right? Right. But I'm not dumb. That's what people want to see. People want to do the Adam used the beautiful women, beautiful, strong, heroic women. And nobody mm-hmm. does that like Adam. Mm-hmm. No, and Wonder Woman had the most incredible, between Bolton to Jones to him, I mean, like, there was a run of, like, years and years where Wonder Woman covers just had one brilliant cover artist after another doing long, really long runs on it that was amazing. And his stand up to anybody's, for sure. You know, just mentioned the, the Ballin covers were great, and Phil Jimenez was a great Wonder Woman cover, cover artist, and Nicola Scott. They all pale next to Adam Hughes when it comes to drawing Wonder Woman. When I interviewed Steranko, when he was talking about modern artists, he singled out Adam Hughes as someone that he always keeps his eye on, that he really finds his artwork interesting. So, so it sounds like that's a sounds like there's something special there for sure. There really is, and you know, and Jim, Jim, I would always like. When I was working on Wonder Woman, I would always send Jim Steranko, who's a pal. I'd send him, you know, tear sheets of Adam's Wonder Woman stuff, like, check this dude out, you know? Yeah. Jim's a real scholar when it comes to the history of illustration. And he said, man, Mark, this guy's as good as anybody. I mean, think, think about that. He's, who were the great, 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 great draftsmen in comics history? Draftsmen right. in comics history. Uh-huh. Mike Rosetta, you know, Brian Bolland, you know. Adam's as good as any of them. In the realm of illustration, especially, right? Yeah. You know, since we're on this subject, one other thing. When we were talking to Tim Sale and with Shakin, they both pretty much pronounced Dave Johnson as the best cover artist currently working and has been for a long time. Yeah. What do you think of that? Dave, man, Dave's sensibilities and mine are really very similar. We both like real graphic images. Yeah. I know Shakin does, too. Dave's. He's such a hardcore designer. I mean, he could draw incredibly well. I wish I could draw like Dave Johnson can draw. But he just gets imagery. He gets picture making. It's right. like, they're like posters, you know? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. They are. Yeah, but yeah. they work so well on covers. You know, they're not... Because I think covers a lot of times have, have become sort of just a, you know, they don't tell a story. They don't really bring you in necessarily. His covers always bring you in, whatever he's doing. Yeah, yeah. I went down, but you know, again, I, when I was running the the variant covers, I, you know, I've told Dave all the time, you know, because he's a pal and he's a real pro. He's always on time. And but I knew I was going to get back a piece and just go, holy shit, look what this guy did. But I was lucky. I, you know, I did that with Frank Cho and I did that with Josh Middleton, who's astounding. Oh yeah, you know, Ryan Sook. Uh, Ryan Sook's just crazy. The guy's just so talented. You know, it was a pleasure to do that job. And the last thing on covers, would be, and this this actually relates to you, is that run that you did with Tim Sale of Detective Comics in 2003 to 2004, which yeah. I think, along with Johnson's detective covers, were just as good as Batman covers could possibly be. But those those are brilliant that Tim did with you. And I, I'd like to know what the collaboration process was between the two of you. I think Timmy was really at the top of his game when he was doing those. He was so... Look, comic you know, comic artists want to draw the great classic characters, the great villains, right? You don't want to do like... You know, you want to do... You know, Tim would call me, okay, so who's this month? And I'd say, oh, it's the Joker. And he'd be cool, you know, he'd be really jazzed by it. And it wasn't, you know, oh yeah, Batman's fighting Banana Man this month. And, you know, because then you're like, oh shit, I have to figure out... I don't want to draw that, you know? But that run had so many great villains in it that Jimmy just teed off on that stuff and he was nice enough to let me color them and they were really fun it was a night it was a really fun it was kind of a triangle it was you know the editor to the artist to the colorist he he did quite a few as i recall 
Yeah, I think uh, during that that run, and you did almost all of them with him. I think you did seventeen in total, and maybe more. Yeah, yeah. I, re- I re- you know I really distinctly remember some of them being really fun. And you know, Timmy's such a great. I shouldn't call him Timmy. It makes <laughs> it makes it sound like he's six years old. Tim's such a great visualist. You know, um, his stuff is so idiosyncratic. It's a little like Paul Pope, where you're sort of like, this guy shouldn't be drawing comics. He's, you know, it's it's not John Buscema. It's not John Romita. It's not mainstream comics. It's their own vision. And fortunately, modern comics allow artists to do that. But I just love Tim's view of the world. Again, it's very uh, influenced by movies, film noir, and poster artists from the 30s. You know, often I would call these guys, and especially Tim and Adam Hughes and Dave Johnson, and I would never really talk about the job. I would never say, well, what do you think you'll do on this kind of... I would talk about, you know, we would talk about Norman Rockwell, or, geez, did you see that show on Netflix that was really well shot, or, or you know, talk about famous American illustrators. And then they'd get off the phone, and they you just had a great conversation, and you were happy to be an artist, a working artist, so they just kind of do their best work, I think. I wasn't tricking them. I certainly wasn't tricking them into doing their best work. I just like talking with these guys about stuff I'm interested in and stuff they're interested in. And then you would get the best work. Yeah. Ah, that's that's great. There's. I want to get to Solo super quickly because you're giving me all these, bringing up Pope and, and, and different things. It makes me want to talk about it. I just want to quickly ask you about the Guide to Coloring and Lettering Comics with Todd Klein. Uh, what was the origin of that project? Watson Gunsell, the publisher, did a series of books with DC, the DC Guide to Creating DC Guide to Penciling, DC Guide to Writing, DC Guide to Inking. And they were, they had heavy hitters doing them. I mean, Denny O'Neill wrote the one on writing, and Klaus Jansen did the one on penciling and inking. And they asked me to do the one on coloring. And I was like, oh, man, that's going to be a lot of I said, you know, I said to myself, that's going to be a lot of work. I really don't want to do that. But I don't want anybody else to do it. So I accepted it. And I think for years it was pretty highly regarded as sort of like the Bible of how to color comic books. Right. Has coloring changed to a degree that, that uh, does it still apply? The technical side of coloring has changed. I mean, you know, because Photoshop comes out with a new version every year and a half, whatever it is. But the first half of that book is about the aesthetics of color and all that stuff, all that stuff doesn't change. It's, you know, it's kind of how to have good taste, how not to have, how not to be all over the place with what you're putting on the page. You know, there was a, when comics first got into computer coloring, it was really gimmicky right off the bat. You had a lot of lens flares everywhere. And you had people using way too much color and yeah. different colors. And Well, I, I have a million colors available to me. I'm going to use all one million of them. And that ain't what it's about, you know. And you see some great colors like Laura Martin and, you know, all these, Dave Stewart, Trish Mulvey, all these great, great colorists. They're not using all those colors. They're just using the computer like an art tool. It's just like a set of oil paints or it's a set of watercolors or good markers. It's what you, it's the talent you bring to the table, not the tools that you have at your at your disposal. Mm-hmm. So going now to New Frontier, because chronologically that's where we are, 2004, I want to focus on what your contribution was to the book as an editor. Like, did you work with him in terms of the whole package, the cover? And the, I mean, it's so well designed from the first page to the last page, as is Solo. I mean, it's these are not just comics that have a cover that's not related to the next page and the next. It's a whole. And that's so clear in, in New Frontiers. Uh, so I want to hear not just what Darwin does, but what did you do to that project? You know, look, I'd love to take credit for the look of New Frontier. You know, I'm a designer as well as an art director and an artist. And if you look at Solo, that's completely me. From the logo to the way it's designed, everything about that. And when Big Comics is completely me, I did the whole thing from a design standpoint. And uh, yeah, Batman Black and White. But Darwin, he did everything on that book. You know, I would talk to him literally every day about where the story was going and send art, set pages in. But that's Darwin Cook's aesthetic. I'd love to steal some credit, but, you know, Darwin just, he did the whole thing from the covers to the inside design to obviously the art and the writing. It was all, it was all Darwin. I would just, it goes back to Archie. 
Parks and Gifts Act facilitate these guys, make it easy for them to do their job, make it easy for them to sit down and write or draw. That's what I did with, with Darwin. I just let them So do when it. those pages and the concepts were coming in, was everybody in the D.C. offices just in awe of it? Because it's, it's just, you know, an amazing piece of work. Yeah. I mean, Darwin's a little, his stuff is a little polarizing because so many people revere it, but you had a few people who thought, well, that's just cartoony. Oh, he's just doing, he's just doing for his tin. He was influenced by Tim. Also, that was by Kirby and Toad. But Darwin was Darwin. He, you know, I never liked when people said, gee, that's just, that's just too simple. That's just, you know, that's just cartooning. That's, that's such a stupid thing to say. It's such an ill-informed thing to say. Like when people look at Toad stuff, a lot of people will say, oh, it's too simple. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you try to do simple. Hey, it's easy to draw a shoulder and draw 40 lines for that shoulder. Try to do the one right line for that shoulder. Right, there you go. That's what's difficult. Oh, that's, well, that's, that's great to know. And, and just says even more about uh, Darwin that, that that's so much just a coming completely from his, his head. Let's move to Solo. Solo, which was done between 2004 and 2006, which you said was one of your babies in terms of design and everything. Was it conceived by you to be a limited series of 12 or did you just see, want to see how far it would run? I wanted to see how far it would go, and sales were good on it, but they weren't great on it. But it was more of like a, a real hardcore fan darling, you know? It, so oh, yeah. I look back on it and with great fondness that I was just, you know, I was just being selfish. I just wanted to work with these artists, and I wanted to see. I remember though when Archie worked, when Archie Goodwin worked for DC, I remember going in his office and saying, hey, I have this idea. Look, I love superheroes, but I'm a little tired of Nobody does Western comics anymore. Nobody does romance comics anymore. Could we do a book that's just all, ro- you know, like all romance comics or prison break stories, you know? And he's like, well, the problem with that is if you do one issue that's all Westerns, then the next issue is prison stories. You get no momentum because it's a different, it's a completely different flavor. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah, you're probably right. And I thought about it and thought about it. And I was like, well, maybe if the hook is the, is the artist, then you're going to walk into a comic shop and see, oh, Tim Sale, I like his stuff, so you're going to pick it up. And you'll be tricked into reading, you know, all the different genres that, that I asked the guys to do, the guys and gals to do. And, it, it, you know, I was just looking at the collection of that of the solo stuff the other day, and, and there was some cool stuff in there. I was really oh, yeah. lucky. There was some really cool stuff in there. Well, before we get to the, the ones that did get made, I want to just ask about the ones that didn't in terms of were there artists that you planned on having or that you talked to about it and it didn't happen because you ran out of time or because they couldn't do it. I know Kaluta said something on our Facebook group about how he had so wanted to do that and then it didn't happen. Yeah. I remember mentioning it to Kaluta. I don't know that, (laughs) I don't know that it was ever, I ever actually asked him officially, but, I love my stuff, so I would have been cool. Walt Simonson was going to do one, and he wanted to interconnect all the stories. And I was like, cool, yeah, great. And I know he's having deadline problems on some other project he was trying to wrap up. So Solo got canceled before he got a chance to do much more than maybe a couple character designs. But his idea was he wanted each story to be different different characters and different times through history. And the, the connecting tissue was a coin that each character had the same coin throughout history. And he, he eventually did it as, once Solo was canceled, he did it as a graphic novel called The Judas Coin. That was going to be a solo project. That was the initial solo, yeah, that he never got around to doing. I oh. forget why he, he couldn't do the solo, but he had to step off, and then, like, maybe two years later, he pitched it as a graphic novel. And I'm glad he did, because it's a really beautiful piece. Yeah, I like it. I read that. It it seemed like some of the people who went and eventually did Wednesday Comics would have been, I mean, Kelly Baker is the most obvious one to me, but there were people like that that just cried out that they should have been on, uh, gotten to do a solo issue. Yeah, I got to use a lot of those people. You're right. You got to use a lot of those people on Wednesday Comics. But I mean, Jim Lee started drawing an issue of solo. I think he did three pages and. He is officially the busiest guy on the planet, so he never proceeded with it. 
I really like Howard Porter's work and he showed me his sketchbooks one time and they were just like, his comic stuff is great, but his sketchbooks are just like from another world. They said, oh, right. you should do this stuff. And then it was canceled. And Sid Kevich was going to do one and George Pratt was going to do one, but the book was canceled. Ah, oh, those both would have been, been great. Well, let's talk about the ones that actually did get published. Did you start with Tim Sale just because he finished first, or was there a strategy to how you were going to do these in order? Well, obviously, with you know, when you kick off a project, you want to get a real popular, you want to get a real popular creator on it. And Timmy was very popular at that time. He was just coming off, I guess, the stuff he did with Lowe for for us for. I have to stop saying us for DC Comics, a Dark Victory. So I knew he had a real following, and he's he's really an artist's artist. He really, I got my cake and eat it too. I got to hire an artist I really loved and respected their work, but also somebody who was really popular. Right. And you actually you actually colored one of those stories on that first issue, right? Did you do Prom Night? <sighs> Did I do Prom Night? Which one's Prom Night? I forget which one that is. I know I colored the the film noir one, the Azarello one, the almost black and white one. Oh, did you do that one? Yeah, which I think is Tim's best work to date. I think that's just astounding. I know I colored the last story, which is about his mom and dad, which was monochromatic, like green and tan. Yeah, it's a nice one. <laughs> yeah, isn't that the one? Isn't that where he's going off to the prom? Maybe that's, but that, cause that's the one I love is, is that he's in the driveway. He's leave, he's walking away and his mom, there's a picture of his mom and dad looking, but you know, you're right. You're, you're I think you're right. Yeah. I know it's about, they mentioned, they talk about a Frank Sinatra song a lot in that, in that story. So that's, yeah, yeah, that's what it is. It's prom night. It's, it's my favorite page from that, that issue is that one as good as the noir one is. It's just, that one's personal to, to me. I just love it. Real nice. And I actually, I, shouldn't say this, but I actually wrote one of them also. Hey, I shouldn't say that, though. Oh, really? Well, because it's um, not on the official credit, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Tim had, uh, like a year earlier, Tim had done, he was dating a girl, and they and they went, like, on vacation to the beach. And he drew this, like, three-page story of him and her walking on the beach, and it was really beautifully, beautifully drawn and painted. But it had no dialogue at all. And I, as, you know, he sent me the, he sent me scans of the pages, because I love his art and wanted to share it. And I said, oh, this is gorgeous. It just as a joke. I put dialogue in there, like, and they're, you know, I made it where they're having a fight on the beach and he's all pissed off because he's got to go back and draw, you know, Spider-Man, Red, White, and Blue, or whatever that book was, and the deadlines and all that stuff. You know, it was just a gag. And then when, a year or two later, when he did Solo, I said, you know, he said, let's print that artwork. I'll draw a few more pages to it. I'll, I'll fill it out a little, but I want you to dialogue it for real. So I wrote the dialogue that's in that story, which had nothing to do with the images, really. I just made up this story about a guy who has to kill his girlfriend for that. Mm-hmm. Wow. I shouldn't have said that because Tim's going to be real mad at me that I said that. <laughs> <laughs> so the second issue, you went with somebody that I think at the time wouldn't have necessarily been instinctively another big seller, which was Richard Corbin, primarily known for the his earlier magazine work. What was your decision to to go with him next? And also, what did you think of that issue? It was an absolutely fascist mercenary decision. I just, I'm a really big Richard Corbin fan. I mean, from back in the days when there was such a thing as underground comics and he would draw these incredibly bizarre, gorgeous comic books. I had asked him to draw Batman Black and White, eight pager. I think it was in the first issue. I think it was. And we became kind of friendly and I asked him to do the solo. And one of the great, great artists. I really loved what he ended up doing for that book. Mm-hmm. And he wrote all those stories. I think he wrote like maybe, he certainly wrote about 90% of them. I think there was, oh no, John F. Cody wrote the Spectre story, I think. Ah. Uh, yeah, let's, let's talk about that for a second, because it's interesting to me. One, Dave Stewart colored it, and it's, I mean, it shows. It's it's great. But also, wasn't wasn't Corbin at this point in a real religious phase of his life? I don't know if that's true. I honestly don't know. I, he's a real interesting guy, but I don't, I don't know if that he is ever... I'm not sure. Honestly, I'm not sure. I had read that, which was interesting, because the specter is that 
is a tricky character in, in that context. But I thought his visual of the specter was really original. I had not seen the all-encompassing use of white the way that it was used in that story. I thought it was really fun. Yeah, yeah, it was time, really cool. And the third issue is Paul Pope. One of the best, I think that's one of the best issues of the whole series for me. I, I love that. Yeah. And if you don't, if you don't fully appreciate Jack Kirby, Paul Pope surely does because that OMAC recreation is, is just so much fun. Yeah. Another guy who just, who just really has a real respect for the history of comics and brings his incredibly unique take to that world. I think I may have colored a couple of those stories, as I recall. Oh, cool. And the next was uh, Chaykin. What's your take on, on Howard? I love Howard. Howard's the greatest. I really like that last story where he talks about how, as a kid, he was, he was too scared to read horror comic books. I, I love the autobiographical nature of that story. That's an aspect I really like about this series when any of them actually bring that in. And we'll get to Darwin Cook's beautiful story in terms of that next, where he does that with World's Window, which I assume yeah. is somewhat autobiographical. It, it, um, it absolutely is, yeah. Well, it's like the, you know, one of the later issues with Sergio Arizona, is, and on one of the pages, like maybe page two, he's talking on the phone to his editor, and He's making all excuses of why he's late drawing his issue of Solo, and the editor was me, so he, he literally, he actually said, oh yes, Mark, I've already drawn half the story, or whatever, but I got the page again, and I'm like, holy shit, Sergio Arizona is talking about me, like specifically talking about me, and mentioning Mark, mentioning me in the comic book. That's cool. Yeah, I, I, that's also one of my favorite issues because it's so autobiographical. It's like half autobiography and half take me back to plop. And it's it's just mm -hmm. so much fun. I think that issue really works well. The only thing I'd say about the Chaykin one was it's not just that last story, but the one before that is so EC focused too because it reads just like one of the preachies that Wally Wood did. Yeah. You know, and so it yeah. seems like it was. So that was that leads me to a question: did, Who decided the order of the stories? And and that was that you, or or did the artist say, "Here they are, and here's how I want them to be told"? It was mostly me figuring that out. Some artists would say, "Yeah, I'd really like it to go in this order," and if I agreed, I certainly would say, "Yeah, that sounds cool." But I did it. I you know, I had to do something that it's really that it's really on it. So. Uh, you know, I would say, hey, I think this is a good flow because you have a Western next to a superhero next to a romance. I would always plot it out like I would always do a book map with little thumbnails of each page. So I would, you know, I'd know the flow of how the book went. So you don't have two really long stories next to each other or, or two Westerns next to each other. But there was, it was nice that there were a lot of Westerns in the series all together. The next one, issue six with uh, Jordy Burnett has that stalking horse story again with Dave Stewart. And it's one of the things when I was going through it, re-looking at this was, boy, those Stewart colored ones just jump out at you. Like you recognize, oh, I bet that's one of his too, because you just, it's just, there's something that just pops out of the page with his colors. Yeah. Um, and Dave's one of the few guys I'm real jealous of because he's a better colorist than I am. And that's probably why I stopped doing coloring because he's just too good. But I'm, no. <laughs> and he's the nicest guy, you know, he's like really laid back and stuff. So he's, man, what a talent. The stuff he's doing with done with Mignola and, you know, yeah, those solo stories. And then, let's see, Michael Allred, that issue just seemed like he was so happy to be playing in superhero land and and i don't think it's just because he's the first one that that's all he did in this was i mean it seemed like it was every story was now i'm going to do kirby fourth world and now i'm going to do uh teen titans and i'm going to do a pinup of metal man it was he embraced that aspect of it like no no one had before him in terms of the series you know the rule was the rule i made up was okay it's short stories you can do whatever genre you want you can write whatever you want relatively. But the only rule is you have to do at least one superhero story, one DC superhero story. So you get all these you get all these artists who wanted to do different genres, you know, science fiction and they and they sort of begrudgingly would do the superhero, but already just 
love superheroes. Like you said, he did all he did all those characters. He did all the superhero stories he wanted to do. Yeah, it seems yeah. he really likes the uh, like the Silver Age of superheroes. It seems like that's a big influence on him. Yeah, yeah, we, we really shared that, you know, because we were both big sixty fans of the sixties and seventies stuff. And, right. Um, and I don't know if you've ever met Mike and Laura already. Uh-huh. No, but they are truly the nicest, nicest people you'll ever meet. They're just. They're real decent human beings. They're just optimistic about life and how lucky they feel they are to be working in the business and drawing their heroes. Like, man, I can't say enough about those two people. Oh, okay. that's great. And she's super talented, too. I mean, her she's a, she's a great colorist. Man, yeah. What a team. So then Kitty Christensen, and I love this issue an awful lot, too. I think the art in this is just fantastic. And it's got a, a real theme to it and it's just uh, it's a beautiful cover it's the interiors are great that uh, love story story in that is is just really nice were you pleased with that issue yeah i'm really glad to hear you say that you liked it because teddy was such a polar is such a polarizing artist and like we did an issue with damian scott and people came into my office and said wow this you know he's such a modern artist and really took balls to use him on this project and you know I really love this stuff, they, you know, they said. And then the other 50% of the people came in and said, this isn't comics, this is crap, what are you publishing? You know, and I would kick them out of my office because they were wrong. But that's the challenge of Solo was to use artists who I really liked. And knowing that Teddy Christensen is just an incredible, incredible artist, but some people might not like it, which can't, it can't, it can't all be mainstream, you know? Mm-hmm. No, it was quiet, and it was it was had a art with a capital A feel to it that I, I think there's a whole segment of comic fans who probably didn't respond to that. And it's kind of amazing that he worked at DC, and that some of these guys worked at DC when they don't have styles that are are traditionally friendly. Yeah, yeah, and you know, and the difficult thing was Solo was one artist pulling all the wait for a single issue so if you didn't like if you don't like tim sale you're not going to buy that issue well with batman black and white i was able to like the very first issue i asked jim lee to do the cover because he was incredibly popular and a great great artist but if you look in that issue there's a jose muñoz story in there right that most kids had never heard of at that time because he was a european artist that i really worship and so yes i kind of tricked people into buying the book and getting something that was good for them without them knowing it. Oh, that's awesome. And so then, then there was, so there was the Scott Hampton one and, and that's, that's an old friend of yours. And he did. Yeah. And were you, were you pleased with that, with uh, that issue? He yeah, mixed up yeah. his, his styles. That's the one where like you could see a, a route with most of the artists, like even though they, they differed the approach to it, but his are so different from story to story in that issue. Yeah, he's such a he's such a uh, multi-talented artist. He's got such variety to his stuff. He could draw any way he wants, which is such a rarity. He, some of those stories in there are my absolute favorites in the entire series. You know, he he, he did a story about a real EC Comics pastiche in there, and there's a story about a little boy who meets Batman, but it's really not Batman. It's a guy. Yeah, I love that one. It, oh my god, it it just brings tears to my eyes. I think it's it's just beautiful. And then we do the Damien Scott one, which I fully appreciate being being polarizing. And again, that's fascinating because where you have the one story where Brian Stelfreeze inks it and it it like changes it completely. And I mean, it seems so much more accessible on some levels. And I like that. And then I turn to the last story, though. And that double page spread on the bat is like the coolest thing in the world. So I think it's a totally, it's a strong issue that ought to be considered. And I, I bet it was probably the most polarizing issue that, well, maybe the last one, which we can, we right. can get to. Yeah, you know, it really was. People, people loved it and people hated it. And that's fine. That's cool. And then everybody loved Aragonis, right? I mean, that issue had yeah. to. Yeah. Yeah, that was a, that was just a that was a no brainer. I just man, did that and sell then, better? No, they all you know it's told about media. You know, obviously the Tim Sales and the guys who were real popular at the time those sold really well. 
Yeah, I would think Sale and uh, Cook would be the ones that were probably just easy ones. Yeah, yeah. I know the series sold fairly well. It wasn't a big success, but it was a big creative success. That's, that's okay. And then Brendan McCarthy is the probably most challenging one. I mean, like, that's like, wow, the DC readers probably were not ready for that. I mean, their brains probably exploded. <laughs> yeah, I don't know that I was ready for that either. I, I, he's, such a, he's such a mad genius, and I, and I wanted to publish a genius, you know, but it's not real accessible. But, man, it's, there's some creative stuff there. And that's one where it has a, I mean, like, it goes from page to page. There's, it's not just like four stories. It has a unity of insanity running throughout the entire thing. Yeah, you feel like you took just an acid and read a comic book. Uh-huh. Yep. Yep, that's pretty much yeah. what it what it was. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's like if you didn't know, just thinking about it, you could look at that issue and say, "Oh, well, that killed Solo. <laughs> that was <laughs> that's the end of that." Mm. So anyway, I want to thank you for that series because it's such a great treat for people who really love comic art, especially because you got it in a in a way that you you don't often get it. So. Well, thank Thanks for indulging us in talking about that in the detail. That any other thoughts about Solo? No, I, I there is that weird wave of nostalgia, like oh, that's when comics were good, you know, from some people. And I'm real proud to have been a part of that, and I I appreciate that you liked it and that people do remember it really well. It was an experiment. It was a little maybe a little indulgent on my part, but hey, as long as it sold okay and and people liked it, then that's good enough for me. And the package and everything, when you say that that's, that's all you, it is one of the most memorable runs in terms of how it's designed and the visuals of cover to cover and back to back. It just, it's such a well-conceived book, not even talking about the content, but just the thematics of it, visual thematics of it. Thank you. So, Alex, you want to? Yeah, I'm, I'm so, worn out for a few minutes talking <laughs> talk right. about Wednesday Comics. <laughs> so, Wednesday Comics, that was 2009, and I loved it. I read all 12 of them, and I just love how it's arranged like a Sunday Comics from the newspapers back when they were early adventure strips. So, how did the Wednesday Comics come to be? Like many people, I'm, I am a fan of the old Sunday Comics. You know, the old comic strips in the newspaper. You know, they used to be so big that were physically so large and then over the years they got smaller and smaller unfortunately but you know as a, as a fan of comics and comic strips I really miss those days of you know I'd go back and collect stuff that was around in the 30s and 40s and you know I was introduced to Crazy Cat you know George Herman's Crazy Cat right. which was certainly obviously before my time before our time but it's a different world you know it's, 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 we forget we, because we never knew that this is, this is one of the popular movies and, and television, you know, and then right up through all the, all the adventure strips, like you mentioned, um, you know, Terry and the Pirates. There's, 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 there's any, any Star Trek movie, any Star Wars movie, any James Bond movie. It was just revealed and kids of the cross Martin ruled that shit. And I was very good friends with an editor named Joey Cavalieri at, at DC, and, and Joey. He's a real knowledgeable guy, and he, he kept saying, hey, man, we should do something with the old script, and I had the same exact idea, and, you know, so I put it together, and it was, it was really fun. I mean, it was a weird experiment. I wonder how it, how people look back on it, because it was these newspapers that were fake enough, and, then, you know, I liked it. I really, I really liked working with it and working with the people on it. I worked with, you know, some really great names again, but I sort of do wonder how people look back on it. Well, I mean, I love it. And I, I looked back on it the other day. Was it hard to pitch to DC at the time? Were they like, well, this, is, this sounds a little too avant-garde? Or, or was it a full green light from day one? Uh, no, definitely not, <laughs> not a full green light. I, you know, I was just mentioning uh, the other day in an interview about how Paul Levitz was the big boss at DC, but always give me a hard time. You know, I'd come into his office all, all excited about, hey, I want to do this new project. And he'd look at me like, no, we can't do that. It, that's mm-hmm. not going to sell. Uh, you know, research has shown that black and white comics don't sell or whatever. He, he, you know, he always right. would pull it. And he's an incredibly intelligent guy. And he probably had reasons, you know, had hardcore data to prove to back up what he was saying. But he always would say no to me. And I would always get upset and, and stalk out of his office, storm out of his office. And 
and then go pitch it again another two months later. And I think I eventually let him down on a lot of this stuff. I see. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I even got to the point where I did a big, you know, I pasted together comic books in the size and shape of Wednesday comics to show him exactly what it would look like. Uh-huh. And, um, you know, I think he could tell from my passion that, mm, yeah, well, okay, let's go ahead and do this. Right. That you probably treat it. You treat it right. Yeah. My office. Then how did you select the artists and writers? Again, just as a fan, you know, uh, I always think the best thing to do as a, as an editor is to come up with projects that you would want, that you would want to read, that you would want to put on your bookshelf. Mm-hmm. Um, so working with, sure, of course I wanted to work with Paul Pope and Neil Gaiman and, and want to reach them again. You know, a few of them, I asked a few of them who weren't able to, like, I wanted Tim Sale to do that, the Batman one on the cover. Uh-huh. Uh, but he wasn't able to do that. I think he was doing something at Marvel. Yeah. But I was just as happy to get Eduardo Riso to do it and, and Azarello. Right. So Jim and I are going to talk about some of the individual ones. So Metamorpho, story by Neil Gaiman, art by Mike Allred. It's an interesting team up of those two talents, I thought. And it's about Metamorpho accompanying Simon Stagg to an expedition in Antarctica. So, you know, how was it receiving those pages from them? And did you give them ideas on layouts before getting the pages from them? Or was that just kind of they created it and sent it to you? You know, how was that? What was that process? It was, you know, the artists always worked with the writers and they they designed their pages. They came up with how they would approach the visuals. I never asked any of them to do them a certain way, a specific mm-hmm. way. That was all them, you know, and some people drew them because, again, they're really oversized pages. Some people drew them in separate panels and then they photoshopped all the panels together because the, the physical size of an art, a piece of art paper to draw it on would have been enormous. But sure enough, you know, Allred drew them full size and he showed me the original. They were like posters. They were incredibly big. Wow. Yeah. Paul Pope, too, if you see those originals, they're, they're enormous. Right. But that was all, you know, again, Archie Goodwin, hire the best and let them do what they do. Don't tell, you know, Joe Kubert how to draw Sergeant Rock Page. Who knows what he's doing? Right, right, right. And then Demon Catwoman, the story by Walt Simonson, art by Brian Stelfreeze. And Catwoman is trying to steal an artifact from Jason Blood. And it was a Morgan Le Fay plot or a ploy. And then they actually sparked their own little romance between uh, Catwoman and Jason Blood. So none of that's supposed to be canon, right? These are just basically fun imaginary tales for this format, right? I think, you know, I honestly think all the stuff I did editorially, mm-hmm. Batman Black and White, Solo, Wizard uh, Comics, I think none of that is considered canon, really, because mm-hmm. it was just fun stuff, you know? Right, like artistic statements, right? Yeah, yeah. And we're talking DC. Does canon even, is that even in a vocabulary any longer? <laughs> I, will, I will not answer that question. <laughs> I don't think anybody did anything that contradicted the basic canon some canon of the characters. You know, Superman was Superman. He didn't, he wasn't smoking a cigarette on page two, you know. Right, right, sure, sure. So then the Hawkman, I love that because there's an Alex Raymond vibe with Hawkman, obviously. And then the action and the illustration, it just had such a warrior approach to it. But the story and art was by Kyle Baker and Kadar Hall f- fights off airplane hijackers, there's an alien invasion, he ends up on Dinosaur Island, Aquaman kind of helps him out at the end, he loses his wings. But what a fun story, because you have, you know, the orchestration of the birds, and planes, and the hijackers, and alien invasions, and monster islands, or dinosaur islands. What was it like seeing those pages? What Were some of these pages just more than you expected getting? Oh my god, Kyle's such a man, you know, another one of these few mad geniuses that pages would come in and I'm like, what? What? Like, you know, he's like, oh, I want to do this whole, I want to do the whole, the whole story, like, as 3D graphics, you know, I want it to look real dimensional, and I'm like, but Kyle, can't you just draw it with a pen, you know, I mean, like your old stuff, and no, no, I got this great idea. You know, Kyle's this weird mixture of, he's sort of a cross between, like, Jack Davis and Will Eisner, you know? Right. That's interesting. There's a real fun, fun nature to his stuff, and Man, he goes down as one of the geniuses. Like he's like Robert Crumb. He's just huh. wow, he's a different way than, than normal human beings. Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting uh, comparison. So then, 
Sergeant Rock, story by Adam Kubert and art by Joe Kubert, which is awesome because I, I was a big fan of the Green Beret strip. I've read every single one, I think. And Sergeant Rock is captured by Nazis and tortured, and he escapes the torture. You know, uh, this was uh, obviously toward the end of Joe Kubert's life, but you know, were you a Joe Kubert fan with his earlier stuff? And, and how did it feel getting these pages and overseeing pages from him? It's Joe Kubert. Yeah, I just, holy cow, you talk about Kirby and Toast. I mean, Joe Kubert's right there. Any comics artist, just worth his salt is just the biggest Joe Kubert fan. Mm-hmm. You know, and I knew Joe, I, you know, I got to know him because we worked together a little bit on that and about a few other projects. But, and he ran that school out in New Jersey, out in Dover. And, I, you know, I'd go visit him to do some business and stuff. And I'd be like, I, I, you're going to think I'm a moron, but I'd be literally like, holy shit, you're Joe Kubert. Oh my God, Joe Kubert, Joe Kubert. And he'd look at me like, Mark, take it easy. You know, what's wrong with you? <laughs> you know, I just couldn't help it. It's Joe Kubert. So yeah, so I'm working with him and Andy on that, which really, I was a little nervous because what if you draw something you don't like? You're going to tell Joe Kubert to redraw something? It never happened, but yeah. Yeah, all those pages are great. I mean, he was great till the very end, right? I mean, he could do, he could, he still kept that skill through all those decades. So Superman, story by John Arcudi, art by Lee Bermejo. It's kind of an interesting story in that an alien kind of, they give him doubts about his connection with Earth. But those panels, uh, Superman, even in his uh, argument with Batman in the story, it, it just had such a heroic portrayal of Kal-El. You know, what would you feel of, of the sequence of those pages, the quality of that illustration when that was coming your way? You know, I'm such a big fan of Lee's work, Lee Bermejo. I think Arcudi is one of the great writers in comics. Mm-hmm. I wish he would be more mainstream stuff, you know, to play with those characters. Every time he does, it's really great. Mm-hmm. But, you know, and Lee Bermejo, geez, I hate the guy because he's this great looking guy. He's this great artist he's really smart he's really talented you know it's like the guy's got everything going for him in life and he's a good pal but god i love his work uh, i'm right. glad to see him as successful as he is yeah that's awesome so batman story by brian azarello art by eduardo risso and uh, there's a, a murdered man's estate and a femme fatale and it was interesting because although he catches the dead man's wife as the person who ended up killing him or being responsible for his death Batman kisses her at the end, right before she dies. So you can tell he likes the bad girl. That seems to be an interesting thing with Batman. What would you think of that? How does that hold up as a Batman story? I thought it was great. I mean, it was a nice plus cover. To, you know, you got your you got your flagship character on the front cover, and Azarello is always a great writer. Always a great writer. Right. And Reese, though, I'm such a big fan of. You know, I haven't looked at that. Shit. I haven't looked at those issues in quite a while. I should relook. I seem to remember getting the page, getting that page in. I may be misremembering. I apologize if I am, but it seems to me that when I saw it, he's kissing her and she dies. Right. But she's going to say something like she's going to, I forget, she's going to spill the beans about something. And he keeps like, he keeps kissing her and not allowing her to say what she was going to say. <laughs> am I misremembering? Like, he doesn't actually kill her. Well, when I read it, it looked like she realized it was Bruce Wayne. And then she right. says, Bruce, question mark. And then he kisses her and there's like, you know, blood on their faces a little too. Yeah. Like, I think he, I think he like, the way I read it, like he holds the kiss a little too long and yeah. she died. So she can't say out loud what she's thinking. Oh, that's funny. Well, cause the cops were right there too. Exactly. Yeah. 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 That's right. All right, Jim, you're, you talk about yeah. yours. Okay. I've just got a couple I want to want to talk about. The ones that I tend to, to love the most are the ones that it doesn't look like a comic book that's just drawn big, but instead looks like it's doing something like the old sheets did. Like it looks like a newspaper sheet. I thought that Sook just nailed it with his Hal Foster instead of Jack Kirby commandy. I, that's one of my favorite out of everything that was, that was done on the Wednesday comics. Oh yeah. And how, how beautifully illustrated was that? I, I think it almost changed the notion of command. I mean, it's, it's awfully hard to do that when Kirby creates it. But I think that Ryan Sook made such an impression on that character with that, that it, it actually carries over. That's how people, some people, now have that in their head as as commandy, which is really yeah. something. Yeah, yeah, it's it's just great. That was a standout. The other standout for me 
was, I think that that Pope Strange Adventures is some of his best work ever. And he's got a lot of best work, but that's just, talk about trippy. It, that's like a whole different experience from, I thought, anything else. Yeah, absolutely agree. You know, I always thought those pages, those pages reminded me of like San Francisco concert poster art. From yeah, the- yeah, totally. You know, like you could, I always wish somebody would have printed those on real nice paper, like as posters, but that would have been real cool. Yeah, just the, just the strongest stuff. I I'm crazy about those are the, the two that I I out of besides some of the things that uh, Alex mentioned. Those are the two that really stand out for me that I could just look at over and over and seem like something that you would see on a comic strip newspaper page rather than anything else. I really like the Dave Bullock. Dead Man, I mean, I think he just, a couple of those where he uses the entire page is just really, really crazy and fun. It looks like, it looks like he's just having such a good time doing this. And, yeah, yeah. you know, that's what I like on that one. Yeah, no, I agree with you. It's got a real, it's got a real power to his stuff. I really wish that he was doing more comics these days. I, I thought he was a real force. He was a real force around that time. I agree. I loved his work. He good, yeah, he was real good friends with Darwin. They had worked together at Warner Brothers Animation. And you saw a little bit of Darwin in there. You saw a little bit of Jack Kirby. But Bullock stuff is all Bullock. You know, he, man, I wish he would come back and do some comics. And the, the other one I would say that I liked because it was really using the the concept of that page was the Flash comics. I tended not to like the main superhero stories as much as some of the the fringe stuff, but the and that was just my my taste, but the Flash one because it broke it up in that Irish West and just the logo of Irish West and doing those two things on the same page. I just I followed that with a lot of joy. And then like halfway through when they take away Iris and they put in Gorilla Grodd and suddenly it looks mm-hmm. like a Tarzan strip. I just, that was exciting to me. I thought that was, who was that? That was Carl and Carl Kershaw. Yeah. And I forget. I'm my memory. Brenda Fletcher or Brendan Fletcher. Brendan Fletcher. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I thought that was honestly, I thought they played with the possibilities of the format more than any other of those stories in, in Wednesday comics. Yeah, I that's that's why I'm including that with as good as Sook and and Pope was. I thought they were the ones that really got the concept. That's yeah, yeah, such fun stuff. All that. Oh, cool. uh, did you want to do a second series and just it it just wasn't going to come together? It was a lot to put together because as an editor, I was one of the rare editors who actually I did all my own, you know, production, you know, uh, putting the pages together and get it ready for the printer. I even do all that stuff myself and that's a lot of work. So I was sort of like, wow, when I was done, man, I was really done. But then like two, three years went by and you kind of forget the pain you've been put through or you put yourself through. You know, and I pitched it again and to the Dio and to Dan the Dio and he said, yeah, we'd like to do that again, uh, but we, sh- we want to do it as digital comics, you know, direct to digital. And I was like, but that doesn't really make sense to me because the charm of Wednesday Comics is that, is that you would hold this big piece of paper in your hand and really the size was the cool thing. But if it's digital, you could blow it up. You could blow any picture up, big or small, you know? So like that idea doesn't that, make any that, sense that, at all. I mean, that would be an interesting project to do in a Scott McCloud, here's all the possibilities of doing it digital, but it's not, it violates the entire premise of what, what this was. I thought so. I thought so. So I kind of, I kind of backed off. I backed off of it. Oh. I, I started talking to a few people like Harlan Ellison. I asked Harlan to write the, the great science fiction writer. I asked Harlan to, to write a, uh, a story for me. And he said, man, I have the greatest idea. And uh, Walt Simonson was going to draw that. So I started, I started lining them up, but then it just kind of fell apart. Oh, boy. Mm-hmm. Well, I just want to, I'm going to have one last thing to talk about, which was the Before Watchmen series, starting with the Before Watchmen series. And I just wanted to ask you first, what was your feeling about it? I mean, about Watchmen and Alan Moore's wishes. Did you have any, any trouble getting your head around that, doing that project? I'll tread lightly here, but I, I disagreed with a lot of, although I respect Alan Moore, I disagree with a lot of, he worked on other creators' characters. 
that the companies owned. Why can't we work on the characters you created? There was a lot of backlash, you know. It was a kind of a funky time. It was people were again very split right down the middle. Azarello and all these guys, you know, we're not gonna just put anybody on these things. But I was so proud of what Darwin did on Minutemen. Did you have input into the approach of those ones that you edited? You know, they would tell me what they were thinking of doing, and I said, oh, that sounds good. Or, like, I remember the Amanda Connor one, and so Spectre, the bad guy was supposed to be Frank Sinatra. Like, literally, Frank Sinatra was supposed to be the bad guy. He was going to look like Sinatra, and, and legal said, don't even think about it, you know? And um, so I think it would have been a slightly better project if, if it could have been actually Frank Sinatra being a bad guy. I, I want to bring us to the end of D.C., and I don't know, Mark, what you want to say or how you want to say it in relation to that, except that this year your time with D.C. ended and to the incredible irritation of many, many of us. Do you want to, what do you want to say about it? Well, I, I, want, I appreciate you saying that. I, you know, yeah, it was kind of heartwarming to see the response back from everybody on Facebook and so many artists and writers and creators and fans and stuff that, you know, it made me feel like I didn't just waste 26 years of my life working for a company. But yeah, I mean, we're not getting into too much. Corporate America stepped in, AT&T bought Warner Brothers and Warner Brothers owned DC Comics. You know, maybe they don't care that much about the creativity of this stuff. And, you know, they had to cut money and I made a good paycheck and they saw me as a, as a dollar amount, which is, which Okay, whatever. You know, uh, look, business is business, and I think that's something people forget. Comic books are a business, and DC is there to make money. Marvel is there to make money, and hopefully you can make some art along the way. So I don't, you know, look, I don't begrudge AT&T for, for their business decisions. I just, it was time for me to move on anyway. You know, I, I wanted to get back to doing my own artwork after all those years, and I've started doing that, and I've got some really cool projects for the for next year that I'm working on now. And I'm actually having a good time drawing for the first time in a long time. That's nice. It sounded like your job was a real time drain and exhaustion such that you didn't get to be the artist that you, you obviously, you know, are. Yeah, but I'm such a, you know, I had all those years, I had that insecurity about my own art with that. I sort of hid behind the job. Look, at the end of the day, it was a great job. Man, I did some fun stuff on that job. It was DC. I love DC Comics. I worked with some great people. You know, Karen Berger and Mike Carlin and all these great, great people in the office. You know, I get to work with Jim Lee every day. I mean, that's pretty cool. I'm not too crazy about one or two other people, but there's no need to get into that. It was a great, great job. And it, I think it's okay. To, it's a good thing to be part of a collective to make. I like to think maybe I made comics a little better from being a behind-the-scenes guy, but you're right, I did put my own artwork on the back burner, and, you know, I'm, maybe it's time to do some art again. Right, there you go. And I think a lot of people are excited about that, too, about that aspect of it. Yeah. Oh, cool. So, besides comics, this is kind of like more of a side thing that we're mentioning at the, at the end of the interview, is you worked on cards for a long time. In the 1990s, you did a, a series of cards on uh, on the history of the Negro Leagues for baseball. And then that was collected in a, in a book uh, for Abrams Publishing in 2007. You've done some Star Wars trading cards, Temple of Dooms cards. So, uh, And you were able to exercise your illustration muscle on these. Can you tell us a little bit about the card career and your involvement in that? Sure. I'm a big baseball nut. I mean, it's really a, a passion of mine. And I did the, I did the um, Disney Negro League cards for Eclipse way back when. I think it was like 1989, I think. And then they collected them as a book. Charlie Kochman at Abrams collected them. And trading cards are fun because, you know, being a comic book artist, an interior artist, is really difficult. Man, you have to draw six panels on a page. It's a lot of work, as I'm finding out right now in my new freelance career. But, you know, you do a single image, you do a cover, or you do a trading card. You spend a day on it, you're in, you're out, you come up with a cool image, and you don't have to draw Spider-Man swinging across a city, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I always loved doing cards. They, they were really, really fun. And, I, you know, and on the baseball topic, I just finished my second baseball book. It's about the, the 100 greatest baseball players of all time. Oh, wow. Really illustrated. Yeah, and I've been working on it for the last five years in my uh -huh. free time, but it'll be, I'm doing it as a kickstarting program 
to the beginning of next season, the 2020 season. So oh, nice. I hope you keep an eye out for it. Absolutely. Yeah, well, we'll uh, make sure that it's mentioned on the uh, Facebook group page, too. That's okay. exciting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mark Chiarello, for joining Jim and I today on the Comic Book Historian Podcast. It was really exciting for us to talk about your involvement in comics history, various key figures in comic history that you worked with, as well as yourself. We really appreciate you joining us today and taking time out of your schedule to do this. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Mark. I I apologize for talking so much myself, but it was just great talking to you about all of this. No, I I, I really thanks for having me. You guys did a great job. You made it really pretty easy for me to talk about myself. Oh, good. One last thing. Carmine Infantino, he was an editorial art director, then he was publisher. You know, do you feel like your art position and art directorial position was, uh, were, were there any analogies going on there between uh, uh, your involvement with DC and his? Maybe in a minor way, I think, you know, Carmine was right out of um, the show Mad Men. Uh-huh. You know, the 60s, and he was a cigar-smoking guy who would tell people what to do, and he was incredibly creative. It was a different world. Uh, you know, I was, I like to think I was, you know, again, I, I, I like to hope people you know, maybe think of me in the same sentence as Archie Goodwin, although I know that's incredibly egotistical to say. And if I learned something from Archie, then, then man, I'm happy with that. Yeah, maybe that's right. The Archie Goodwin of the 2000s. I can go with that for sure. Oh, thanks. <laughs>